Hello and welcome everyone to this workshop on India's bankruptcy resolution framework. This is the first in a series of workshops done in India on the theme of economic recovery and resilience in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. Insolvency and bankruptcy laws and institutions are critical to the process of economic recovery. They help ensure that in the wake of a crisis, healthy firms survive and thrive, and the death of unhealthy firms occur with minimal disruption. They also enable the financial system to allocate capital to the most efficient firms in the most systemically stable manner. Today's workshop is designed to discuss the extent to which India's bankruptcy resolution framework can support a sustained economic recovery. And we have a set of distinguished speakers to comment on this issue. Today's workshop is divided into two parts. In the first part, I and my colleague Sinesh Rai will present our analysis of India's non-financial and financial bankruptcy resolution mechanisms. Dr. Susan Thomas will provide comments on my presentation. Dr. Thomas is a senior economist and was a member of the Bankruptcy Law Reforms Commission. Sayasha's presentation on the bankruptcy of financial firms is followed by Governor Dr. Sayasha. Dr. Sayasha is currently an advisor to present our analysis of the Ministry of Finance. He is in charge of the divisions on financial legislation and reforms, financial stability, and currency and coinage. The second part of the workshop will consist of a panel discussion moderated by Dr. Rajeshwari Sengrupta. Before we proceed, I would like to request all attendees on Microsoft Teams to keep your mics and videos off for the duration of the workshop. Anyone with a comment or a question can use the chat window and we will try to respond to as many comments and questions as possible. Those who are watching this through YouTube can also use the comment section and my colleagues will relay your comments and questions to us. Thank you. I will now begin presenting on the insolvency and bankruptcy board. Please give me a minute to upload my presentation. Those who are watching this through YouTube can also use the comment section. My colleagues will relay your comments and questions to us. Thank you. I will now begin presenting on the insolvency and bankruptcy board. Please give me a minute to upload my presentation. To provide comments on my presentation. Hello and welcome everyone to this workshop on India's bankruptcy resolution framework. This is the first in a series of workshops done in India. I hope you can all see the presentation. So what I want to do today is to talk about the IBC Awards framework in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic and the economic recovery that needs to take place after the lockdown. So I'll spend the initial part of my presentation to just set the economic context uh, in which the lockdown occurred and then move on to the role of the IBC uh, in helping the process of economic recovery and the issues with its functioning at present. And then the last part will focus a little bit on the need for some changes uh, to occur in order to facilitate medium term economic growth. So even before the pandemic hit, the Indian economy was slowing down and GDP growth was sub 5% from January to March 2020. And the finance ministry had written to uh, banks to actually request them to stop taking uh, debtors to the IBC, to the NCLT by default, and to focus more on economic reorganization and restructuring. And it was in this context that uh, the pandemic hit and there was a complete lockdown, a complete shutdown of the economy. And what happens during uh, situations like this is that firms are starved of demand and liquidity pressures lead firms to become uh, rapidly insolvent and this happens prematurely for a number of firms because even for firms that were slowly becoming unviable the complete shutdown of the economy makes them go into insolvency prematurely 
And for healthy firms, it's complete value destruction because uh, their uh, demand has also completely shut down. And of course, both of this also leads to unemployment losses, uh, to employment losses that could have been prevented. So in this context, policy measure, measures should prevent uh, unnecessary closures and liquidations, uh, smoothen the process of creative destruction that should happen in the wake of uh, economic shutdown like this, and lastly, enable recovery and consolidation of healthy firms. So these are the three broad buckets in which I want to focus today's presentation. So the Indian government took some measures to actually do some of this. Uh, one was to suspend the ability to trigger the IBC and insolvency proceedings under the IBC. Uh, Section 7, 9, and 10 of the IBC were suspended so that uh, either a debtor or a creditor could not file an insolvency application in the NCLT during uh, the period from March onwards. And uh, earlier this month, it was extended by another three months. So a nine-month period uh, was completely removed. Uh, the ability of debtors or creditors to file insolvency applications was completely suspended during this nine-month period. In addition, thresholds for filing insolvency increased from 1 lakh to 1 crore. And the government also announced that it would have a separate proposal or a separate framework for MSME-related insolvencies because they were obviously very hard hit by the lockdown. And what this, ha what this actually means is that firms defaulting during these nine months can never be taken to the IBC for a default during this period. So... And for the rest, it has become a little harder to trigger insolvency because thresholds have increased. So this has saved firms that would have become insolvent due to the lockdown because who were even otherwise healthy or viable, but because of the lockdown, they probably would have gone into insolvency or would have defaulted on their debts. And it also saved firms who were otherwise on the verge of becoming insolvent even before the IBC suspension due to the economic slowdown. So healthy firms and unhealthy firms were both saved. Uh, creditors also lost the ability to take defaulting firms to IBC. And one small benefit of this was that uh, there was a possible scope of reduction in cases coming up before the NCLT. In parallel, the Reserve Bank of India also announced a slew of measures. It announced a, a moratorium that basically allowed lenders to uh, impose a moratorium on debts that became due between March 1 and August 31. And it said that for any uh, debts in respect of which a moratorium was given, there would be no asset classification downgrade. And as per the RBI data, a significant chunk of borrowers actually availed of this moratorium. Uh, so while it saved or it helped save a lot of uh, firms or individuals from defaulting on their debts, uh, in the medium run, it also has some negative effects, which is uh, it actually can have the effect of crowding out investments into younger and more dynamic firms because uh, moratoriums or credit extensions are being given to existing credit worthy firms. And loan extensions and the IBC suspension can have a role in preventing unnecessary destruction in the immediate aftermath of the lockdown. But if this continues for too long, there is a risk that it could create uh, this whole problem of zombie firms where uh, firms that are not very productive or not innovative crowd out uh, credit that can be given to more dynamic and more productive firms. So just for a, a comparison, this is from the uh, World Bank's uh, note on COVID-19 related financial rescue measures. So they've also broken the possible policy measures into three phases. They said phase one is basically to prevent viable firms from going into insolvency prematurely. And the second phase is to basically ensure that the increased number of firms that will go into insolvency actually do not go through it. And there have to be some policy measures to support this. So the IBC suspension and the RBI's measures actually do some of this. 
And the third part, which is what the rest of the presentation is going to focus on, is basically going to be around looking at how to recover from this and move on from this process and to actually provide some flexibility to debtors to reorganize efficiently and come out of this uh, of this process. And in this process, IBC, IBC is actually critical because it's compared to all the existing alternatives, it's still the best institutional framework for uh, resolving firms that in the economy and for smoothening the process of creative destruction. For one, it actually addresses all creditors and treats them equally. The, one of the problems with all the frameworks outside IBC is that they are mostly uh, about firms, uh, lenders who are regulated by the RBI, but not so much for other lenders. So the IBC really addresses all creditors, not just banks and BFCs, but also bondholders, other kinds of lenders. Uh, so far, recoveries under IBC have been far higher than pre-IBC mechanisms. So actually, lenders have had a lot more comfort under the IBC than other mechanisms. And even in terms of the time taken for this recovery process, the IBC has been much better than non-IBC mechanisms. The current average uh, time for resolution within the IBC framework is just over a year, whereas in all of the previous mechanisms, the average time taken was around four, four and a half years. So the IBC is actually the best institutional framework we do have for the efficient resolution of firms in the economy. So then the natural question is then why was it suspended? And one question, we, one point we've obviously discussed is it was done to prevent otherwise healthy firms from going into liquidation. But this became necessary also because of what the IBC actually did within the Indian financial system. And one of the most important things it did was it changed the relationship between debtors and creditors quite significantly. All pre-IBC mechanisms were actually mechanisms where the debtor retained control of their business or their firm, and creditors could recover assets from the debtors. And this affected the ability of creditors to recover from the debtors because they could not actually take control of the firm and uh, run a resolution process. So the IBC changed this balance completely in the other direction and by default creditors took control of the firm as soon as insolvency was triggered. And once the law was enacted, two issues that led out of this change in uh, power balance uh, created a lot of conflict. One was that because it was a new law and it did something so radical, there were a number of challenges to various provisions of the IBC. The constitutionality of the IBC was challenged. A number of questions were raised about whether time limits within the IBC are mandatory or not. The relationship between creditors and debtors different types of creditors was uh, looked at. And then there was also a whole issue of uh, the extraneous issue of uh, crony capitalism, which was becoming more and more relevant uh, at that point of time. And Section 29A was introduced in the IBC to actually prevent a significant class of debtors from bidding to take back control of their firms. And this led to further conflict and more litigation around who was an eligible debtor and who was ineligible to bid for their firms. Related to all of this was, of course, the question of judicial capacity of the NCLT, which handles IBC cases. And NCLT was an existing tribunal, but IBC was a huge new law that had to be dealt with by the tribunal. So the capacity had to be built up. And there have been complaints of delays and unnecessary litigation. So all of this fed into a need for suspending IBC. But there are also some other structural issues that I want to focus on that have become more relevant in the post-COVID economy. One is that uh, a significant percentage of firms actually go into liquidation under the IBC framework. And this is a problem because liquidation takes longer and it uses much more judicial time and recoveries are generally lower compared to a firm being resolved before liquidation. Uh, the other is that the way IBC has operated in the last three and a half, four years, it has significantly curtailed a debtor's ability to 
retain or regain control of a firm. So the firm goes out of a debtor's control as soon as IBC is triggered, a moratorium is imposed, a committee of creditors is set up, an insolvency professional is appointed who runs the firm on behalf of the uh, committee of creditors. In subsequent processes, section 29A then disqualifies many debtors from uh, taking back control of the firm or from even attempting to take back control of the firm. And then there is related litigation that adds to delays. In addition to this, the way the resolution process works has essentially become a bidding process that looks at the amount or the value that firms are, that bidders are uh, offering for the firm rather than the reorganization plan. And the focus has therefore become on the highest value of recovery rather than the business reorganization. So, and this has been compounded by the structure of the banking sector where we have a lot of PSU banks who are subject to CBI, CVC uh, norms. So for example, in 2018, the IBA, the Indian Banks Association, had a meeting where a number of bankers passed a resolution that they would only negotiate with the highest bidder in a resolution process because that would be compliant with the CVC guidelines on this subject. So this converted a more holistic approach within the IBC into a plain auction mechanism. And this places debtors at a disadvantage since their inside knowledge of the firm, their ability to think about how to restructure and reorganize the firm is deprioritized. So IBC is increasingly becoming a debt recovery mechanism rather than a reorganization mechanism. And we need to change this going forward. So we need businesses to have a better shot at reorganization and we need to tweak the IBC to cope with this need to reorganize and restructure, especially for MSMEs and retail borrowers who've been hit hard by the pandemic. And added to this is the problem that the provisions for individual insolvency have not been operationalized and a lot of this could have been availed of uh, during this period had it been operationalized. And we need parallel changes and capacity building for handling the increased caseload. So I'll just spend the last two minutes talking about some proposals for change. So one is that we should think about an additional debtor in control framework within the IBC that operates in addition to the creditor in control framework. And this could be something similar to the chapter 11 process in the US bankruptcy law, where a debtor can file an application even before the firm actually becomes insolvent or defaults on a debt. Uh, and therefore avoids the uh, process of a creditor triggered insolvency. In this kind of a process, the debtor files an application, becomes a debtor as a trustee, and a stay operates like very similar to the moratorium in India. We can think about suitable adaptations to the Indian context where a debtor could reserve an exclusive right to file the first reorganization plan and the creditors would vote on whether this makes sense to them. But you could give a much shorter time period for this entire process to take place. The moratorium could be much shorter. Voting thresholds can be made more stringent so that the debtor actually needs to meet a higher bar compared to the chapter 11 standards. Uh, the supervision of the documentation, the reorganization plans, accuracy, etc., can be supervised by uh, insolvency professional appointed by the committee of creditors. And the creditors would, of course, reserve the right to trigger insolvency proceedings if this did not work. So the benefits for the, of this are, A, it provides a reorganization mechanism that is currently not taking place. Uh, B, it overcomes the political economy problems of uh, creditors rushing to recovery, the whole uh, pressure that they feel in complying with CVC norms and so on. Uh, it also retains existing creditors' powers and it can have the added benefit on reducing the judicial time spent on liquidation and IBC related litigation because things like Section 29A would not apply in this uh, situation. Uh, in addition, we should also think about how to operationalize the individual bankruptcy provisions. Uh, the last part is thinking about capacity building within the NCLT and there have been fears that the NCLT will be flooded by a wave of bankruptcy cases after this pandemic. Uh, there are two mitigating factors. One is that the suspension of the IBC has ensured that at least firms that default within this nine month period, uh, they are never taken to the NCLT. 
So that reduces a large pool of cases that would otherwise have gone into uh, bankruptcy. The second is that the RBI resolution scheme will enable many firms to avoid defaulting. And even lenders might prefer restructuring loans rather than triggering insolvency because right now the market for actually buying up just trust assets might not be very viable and you might not get good recoveries in this current situation. However, many firms will still default once the suspension ends. And therefore, we need to think about increasing judicial capacity. And here, I would like to make two points before I end. One is there is an obvious need to improve judicial infrastructure. But the other is also to reduce the incentives to use judicial resources. So uh, on the addition of judicial infrastructure, yes, government is doing things to improve judicial infrastructure. Uh, judges are being added. Uh, the government is considering creating dedicated IBC benches. Uh, digitized court management systems are being talked about. And all of these will add to efficiency and capacity within the NCLT. However, we do need to think about the incentives to use the NCLT's time and to come to the NCLT or even to other uh, courts. So just as an analogy, if you improve infrastructure, if you improve the number of highways in a, a location, it often leads to more cars and more vehicles rather than reducing uh, traffic. Similarly, the incentives to litigate should be reduced. The amount of judicial time spent on liquidation and other court intensive processes should be reduced. And some of this can be done by creating a debtor in position framework. So uh, if we don't have this uh, single framework where almost all resolutions end up in this recovery mechanism and create alternatives that can exist where you do not need intensive court scrutiny, we can actually reduce the workload for courts. So I'll just stop here and I'll say this is uh, these are the policy measures that we should be thinking of in order to actually smoothen the process of creative destruction and to enable the recovery and consolidation of healthy firms. And I'll stop here and I'll invite uh, Susan to comment on this now. Thank you. Thanks, Anirudh. Can, can you hear me? Oh, perfect. Okay, so uh, Anirudh talks about uh, the crisis that India is going through and uh, trying to see whether our insolvency resolution frameworks are adequate. And uh, particularly, uh, he takes our attention to all the changes uh, or all the interventions that have been done. Uh, in order to uh, buttress the process of dealing with uh, the stress that something like the pandemic has uh, generated in our economy. Uh, so I'm going to take, as usual, a 30,000 foot view because I really don't think I can disagree with too much uh, with what Anirudh has presented. I think it's a nice landscaping of the situation of uh, stress in India that is related to the pandemic the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, I just want to introduce some frame a framework in which perhaps to place some of these things, because I think that perhaps once we look at it from that perspective, we see some new questions that arise in terms of even the interventions that have been done. And then are there additional things that can be done to help improve the core question of when there is stress that is triggered by such a systemic shock, uh, what is it that state can be expected to do? Uh, okay. So that's what I think uh, this is to be done. So uh, let's uh, recall that this is a systemic shock and this is not systemic just for India, it is systemic globally. So this is kind of like the 2008 financial crisis, which affected everybody. So we can't automatically just say, okay, let's just get liquidity from somewhere and help bail out these guys, right? But when we think about state level interventions, I think it is an obvious one to think that state is out there, they have more convening power, more uh, fundraising power than individuals or firms. And therefore, the first automatic thing that we think is the state must come in and infuse liquidity. Right? And that is what some countries have done. Like the UK has furloughed its employees to reduce the stress on the overall economy. 
But I suspect that if we take a deeper look at the economics of the situation, that is okay for countries that have fiscal freedom. I don't think that India is in that position. Therefore, we must look to other ways and means in which we do this. Uh, it's interesting that uh, the idea of uh, the suspension of IPC comes up because it made me laugh because in our rationalizing a design for an insolvency resolution process, we said that any kind of stress is something that exacerbates information asymmetry for all the stakeholders, right? So there are some people who know more than others. And if only we can get everyone to be calm for a short while, they can figure out what's happening on the ground and come up with the correct responses. So I think about the kind of IBC suspension that has happened as something like the state having introduced a calm period, right? So the only question is, and, and, and you know, Anirudh explained it, and for me, it is, a, it is the correct idea that we need all people to calm down for a bit and understand there is a slowdown, understand where is it going to be hitting the hardest, where is it that's going to be hitting the slowest, right? Because it's not like all parts of the economy will be squeezed in a similar manner. And that's the whole issue. You can't have a one-size-fits-all solution in terms of resolution because there are going to be different parts of the economy that will respond differently. We also need all stakeholders to understand what is the cost, come up with an estimate, understand what are the possible avenues to go and reach out to uh, plug the cost. Can we get some... Uh, sources of funding from within, whether it's individuals or firms. Uh, Anj uh, Renuka and Anjali have an article out that looks at cash flows and cash reserves of firms. And there's a huge heterogeneity across which firms can hold out during the pandemic longer than others, right? And once we have this assessment, every individual can go out or every person can go out and say, if I can't get it fully from within, can I go and get it from the domestic market? Can I go and get it from the international market? If all of this fails, can I go to my bab and say, please, can you bail me out? And this is the amount that you need to bail me out of the tuna. So that's a good, that's a good place. A right? calm period is a great thing when you have overall systemic uh, panic under a pandemic. The question really that we need to ask is, how long should this calm period be? And because you can stretch it out indefinitely and say until we get a vaccine that is going to be a moratorium but that's not really helpful at all because we know that uh, day by day people are still facing the stress whether you have an ibc suspension or not the stress is there people are starving people are not able to make their bills make ends meet kids are being taken out of school because there are no fees to be paid Schools themselves are start shutting down because there's no cash flow. So the question is, how long should we keep this calm period on? And that's what I think, Anirudh, one of the things is that we should bring up front, right? It's okay to have an IBC suspension. In three months, most people on the ground will actually understand what is the impact. So if you look at the financial services firms, right, they've been preparing for what happens when the moratorium is lifted and they have to go back to business as usual. And today, some of these firms are back to 90% collection efficiency, whether it is at the MFIs or at the affordable housing loans. People are coming back on track and it hasn't taken all of the time that IBC suspension has been suspended for people to come back on track. In that case, why is it that we are keeping a bottleneck on the IBC uh, as a suspended method through which all kinds of persons can come to resolution is something that we really need to ask and think about because I think this is central, right? IBC, as you correctly point out in your presentation, is something that benefited all stakeholders, particularly all creditors, right? We have this Indian peculiarity, if I may call it that, where we believe that creditors is equal to banks. And in your presentation, you show that currently what we have is, we used to have the IBC, now we have an RBI-led restructuring mechanism as the primary or the dominant source. But those are only things that are applicable to RBI regulated entities. But if we look at the creditor class in the country, there is a whole lot, right? Even today, if you look at the balance sheet of the firms, you will see that 30% probably comes from banks. But firms are able to get debt from many sources, including insurance companies, pension funds, the public markets are small, but they are still there. Stressed asset management companies, all of these are players in the credit market. And if during this period, we are depending upon restructuring mechanisms that are primarily being designed 
for RBI regulated entities, it is going to be a problem. Right. And so, uh, so I think that that's the second element that we should think about as we think about how to use the calm period, because if there is not going to be sufficient uh, resources in the banking sector, we are going to have to go out to the larger market. And there we are going to run into trouble if all our policies are being designed to support just one set of system, or one set of individuals. So coming to the question of, OK, fine, we have this calm period. We should really question about how long the calm period should be because it is in suspending an instrument that's open to all creditors, not just the bank-led creditors. Whereas today we are stuck in a world where it's only bank-led or RBI-led uh, creditors that are getting support. Uh, how do we then think about a resolution processes and strengthening it in this current period, right? And what can state do for uh, to help strengthen it? Uh, ultimately, that state should worry about making resolution or facilitating resolution period. Right. So in your slideshow, I take umbrage of the fact that there's a clear, there appears to be a clear division between restructuring and liquidation, restructuring good, liquidation bad. I would rather say, reorganize it to say, it's not about restructuring and liquidation. It's about resolution good, not resolution bad. Right? Because every day of not resolving the stress is one more day of capital, land, and labor being stuck in unproductive use. Okay, liquidation also at the end of the day, if you go through the liquidation process quickly, I agree with no delay in liquidation processes, but it's not like liquidation process do, does not free up all of these economic resources to better production. So my sense is I would rewrite that story that you are saying that uh, while I agree with you in reading how IBC has been uh, turned around to say more restructuring versus reorganization, Liquidation is bad is the place where I say that's not clear to me because for small firms, let's just understand, okay, this pandemic has been a structural change in the organization of economic activity. There are going to be some kinds of things which will never go back to way where it was before. And yet it's not like there is not a core of economic activity that will go in a new reorganized form. Liquidation is killing the organization. Liquidation is not killing the economic activity. So as long as we accept that, liquidation is actually a great way to reorganize and take it forward. So I think that once we are agreed on that, how do we come to quick resolution? Because delay is the killer. We should figure out how to do this quickly. You suggested changes in the law. And I agree with you on refocusing IPC's uh, debtor uh, resolution uh, assistance. But if I remember correctly, if you go back to volume zero, the rational document of the IBC, it was never visualized as not having a debtor triggered insolvency resolution, right? There was actually exactly the kind of things that you described, tighter onus or stronger onus on the debtor if the debtor is to be triggering it. But my sense is that we don't necessarily need to visualize a different chapter 11 kind of process, which is debtor triggered. It says that when the debtor triggers, there is going to be a lot more uh, stringency on the what the debtor has to provide as proof of being able to trigger the insolvency resolution process. I'm quite clear it's then the rationale document. I've always been puzzled as to why people call IBC a creditor driven process, because in the original visualization of the IBC, that was not the case. So my sense is we should revisit that part of the uh, rationale and see what we can do in terms of bringing it together. I completely agree with you that section uh, 29A was a complete debtor killer. And perhaps that's a reason why people think about it so much as a creditor driven process as compared with debtor. And lastly, I completely agree with you on state worrying about how to strengthen the, the institutions of the IBC ecosystem. Because that's what we need to have ready to uh, uh, ready and ready to go whenever it is that they decide to unsuspend IBC, if I can say it that way. And the two elements that are alive and kicking today are the insolvency resolution professionals. And the question is, what do they need to be able to walk in and resolve quickly? Information asymmetry is something that we worried a lot about when designing the IBC. And today, one missing element is the information utilities. If we have information utilities up and running, my sense is that would be a great help for insolvency resolution professionals, as well as a creditor committee when they want to defend a particular kind of a resolution plan. The second is the NCLT, and I think all your suggestions are on track. 
there was an increase in the NCLT cases that were related to IBC matters. I believe there has been some thinking and development of thinking about IBC or bankruptcy tribunals as special tribunals as compared with the NCLT as an overall tribunal. Uh, but uh, more than just increasing bench strength, right? Today, more than ever, after having read Anjali and Bhargavi's article on looking at how NCLT has been dealing with coming out of lockdown. So in their article, they look at the causeless of the NCLT. And what they find is that six months after lockdown started, NCLT is still operating at 20% of the, what they were doing before lockdown. Now, if the financial services firms who are actually dealing with debt recovery are up to 90% of capacity, what is it that is preventing the NCLT to coming back on track in terms of closer to 90 and staying at 20? I suspect it's not just about adding judges because we've done that in 2018. We've increased the spread. It's not worked, right? Because they were just not able to deal with it. So we do need to worry a lot more about the processes. Uh, think more about creating systems that support judges to come up with judgments faster as compared with adding more judges. Because my sense is if you add more judges, you get a lot more heterogeneity and variation in the cases and the judgment, which is actually going to raise the uncertainty about IBC as a tool as compared with not. So happy to have read your paper. I, I think that you're on track with some of most of these things, except for the two fundamental stuff that I just talked about. We do need to worry about how long the account period should be. And I do not think that it's restructuring versus regulation. It should be resolution versus not resolution and do whatever it takes to make the system stronger that can help resolution, whichever way it comes to free up capital. Thanks. That was my, my thoughts. And I'm looking forward to reading the final paper. Thanks a lot, Susan. This was really helpful. I think uh, we have just a couple of minutes, so I'll respond very quickly. I think I do agree with the point of a resolution versus uh, reorganization versus liquidation. And I think I need to put this more clearly, but the point there was, are we designing incentives in a way where you're pushing firms into liquidation rather than the economic incentives play out their role properly? And I think... No, I agree, but I think that you draw, I think I think the two pieces are once you keep the debtor out, and I think that comes out in your paper, right? Once you keep the debtor out, then you are going to end up with a large number of firms, particularly the small ones, where if you do not have the debtor in play, it is going to be pell-mell disaster in terms of a sensible economic resolution. But let me say this that even if it is a liquidation, it is not necessarily that the firm's economic activity uh, has died. The human capital is broken up. It needs to be reorganized differently. But my sense is that liquidation is better than not, resol not resolving because that ties up the human capital. It ties up the ca financial capital and whatever other resources for a much longer time. You should just get it done quickly so that the debtor can then go back to all of those resources and say, guys, let's start a new company, let's reorganize it differently. We are going to be doing work from home, so it's a completely new set of economics. Let's take it forward. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, that's well taken. The other point is on the creator friendliness or relative data unfriendliness of the IBC. And I agree, the original rationale was very different, but I think the point I'm trying to make is that the way it's operated, it's worked out quite differently. And I think we need to see how we can change yeah. that now. Uh, no, I think, I think were, yeah. Sorry, if I can just add, right? I guess I agree with you 100%, except that I think that when you add a completely new chapter, uh, the way that I've seen law work in India now, it just creates potential for loopholes, right? So yeah. my sense is taking existing chapters and provisions and adding the nuance of allowing for debtors to take it as we had originally visualized in the design may be a more efficient way possible, but I do agree that it's a point of discussion. Thank you, Susan. Uh, there were a couple of questions I can give very, very quick responses to. So Rohit had a question on the key differences between public sector banks and the approach of private sector banks. And I think the point I was trying to make was that the public sector banks are such a large part of the banking sector that their incentives really dictate the incentives of the banking sector. And that is something that plays into the IBC and how the IBC process works. On 
the comment on the supreme court case on loan moratoriums honestly i don't think the supreme court has any business talking about it uh, this is a purely financial decision it should be left to lenders and the financial regulator uh, so i'll stop here and uh, thanks susan again this was really great feedback i'll take Thank this you, and work on my paper and i'll hand over to sarsh now Thank you, Anirudh. Hello, everyone. Uh, changing tracks, I'll talk about the uh, bankruptcy of financial firms and the framework for resolving failed financial firms or financial firms that are at the verge of bankruptcy. Uh, I hope you can see my uh, slideshow here. Uh, so my argument has five parts. I'll just run them quickly and then I'll go into details. First is that we should expect a rise in financial firm bankruptcies in the next uh, few months and years. Uh, even though at the moment, because of the moratorium, the crisis in the real economy has not transmitted to the financial system, it will eventually do so, and we'll have to deal with it. And uh, we need to prepare for this crisis. Second part of the argument is that the present framework for financial firm resolution is quite weak, and it will need to be strengthened. Third, the government knows that it is weak. Between 2013 and 2018, it had tried to reform this framework, but it had failed because of political economy reasons. Because it failed, uh, it has since, since 2018 tried to do some patchwork reforms to uh, bridge some of the gaps, but still substantially a lot needs to be done. And finally, I'll present some ideas about what kind of reforms are required and how to do reforms when there is a crisis going on and what can be the way to get to a comprehensive reform. So on the first point, uh, as some of you may know, for the last uh, decade or so, Indian financial system has going through a series of balance sheet crisis. Initially, we were in somewhat of a denial around it. Between 2011 and 2015, there was a lot of regulatory forbearance. There was a lot of a delay in recognition of bad loans. And bad loans were allowed to be restructured through a series of schemes. And uh, when the asset quality review was done in 2015, it turned out that many of these restructured loans were not, I mean, they did not have a chance of becoming standard loans. So then the, I mean, the proper recognition of bad loans began. And since then, there's been an effort to repair the balance sheets of banks. And more recently, from 2018 onwards, we've seen an increase in stress in NBFC balance sheets as well. And we have seen several high-profile financial firm failures since 2018. We know these ILNFS, a couple of private sector banks, one private sector bank, one government-owned bank and a cooperative bank has failed. These are all relatively large banks. Uh, just to, to I mean, uh, reiterate this story that has played out since 2015, there was a rise in uh, non-performing assets of uh, banks, mainly because there was better recognition of these loans. Many of these loans had gone bad earlier, but were restructured. And since 2018, there has been a steady decline. But even then, in 2020 March, the ratio of GNPAs is actually almost double of where, where it was in 2015. And therefore, I mean, the repair process is still going on. And NBFC NPAs have also been rising recently. Uh, and against this backdrop, this crisis has come. And uh, we don't know. It's a situation of radical uncertainty. We really don't know how, in what ways, through what pathways it will impact uh, different financial firms. But some efforts have been made to uh, make some predictions about what might happen. RBI had released a uh, financial stability report in July uh, where it had presented certain scenarios. The worst scenario was assuming 8.9% decline in GDP during the course of the year. And in that scenario, it uh, projected that the uh, NPA ratio would rise from 8.5% to 14.7%. Now, recently, RBI has uh, predicted 9.5% decline in GDP, and uh, IMF has uh, predicted an even higher decline. So other analysts have also predicted 10% of higher decline. So we can perhaps expect almost a doubling of the NPA ratio during the course of this year. So this is just banking, of course, but there are uh, other sectors also, NBFCs, possibly other form of uh, firms that take uh, housing finance companies and so that, that take consumer funds on their balance sheets that could get into a crisis. OK, so there's going to be a crisis probably, and they will have a rise in financial firm failures. But what is what is the framework to deal with it? So even though we don't know the extent of the crisis and how bad it's going, badly it's going to affect us, we need to prepare ourselves. We need to uh, invest in the robustness and resilience of the resolution framework. But to, that, to do that, first we need to understand what the problems with the current framework are. 
So before I talk about the law and the institutions uh, that comprise the framework, if you just reflect on the experiences of uh, financial firm failures in the just last two years, which I guess is a part of our shared memory, uh, just a few facts stand out. One is that many of these failures were just sudden. There was actually no expectation based on reported data. If you look at Yes Bank's capital adequacy ratio in December, uh, it was as good as any, any other private sector bank. It was just about the average private sector bank. But in March, it failed very precipitously. Island FS uh, was a well-rated NBFC. It was a core investment company, more intensively supposedly regulated by RBI. Uh, and But they failed almost suddenly. So there is something going wrong in the way we uh, monitor these firms and recognize their failures. Once we recognize the failures, the methods of resolution are very ad hoc. And they often involve use of public funds. IDBI Bank had to be bailed out by LIC, which is a government-owned financial institution. And also central government last year put in 9,000 crore rupees of additional capital into IDBI Bank. Yes, Bank had to be bailed out by a consortium of banks, again led by a public sector bank. So indirectly, it is a bailout by government, it can be argued. Island FS resolution is still going on more than two years since the first default happened in 2018. And uh, now recently they had asked for extension that the resolution may go on till maybe 20, 2022 also possibly. So there is, even if you just don't know the laws and the institutions and how they function, you can see that there is uh, uh, something lacking in the framework. Now I'll give you a quick overview of what the frameworks uh, framework is in, uh, that is in place right now. So if you look at banks, there are within banking also there are four different uh, regimes of resolution. For private sector banks, it's different. For public sector banks, different. Uh, regional rural banks, cooperative banks, are different frameworks. The instruments of resolution are very limited. Uh, they are mostly focused on merging and amalgamating a failed bank with another bank, which is healthier. And often the uh, bank that is that has to buy the uh, failed bank, it turns out to be a public sector bank, which then absorbs the loss. We saw that in GTB. We have seen it in other banks as well. And most of the, in most of the cases, it is power is not given to an authority which actually exercises it. It's mostly dispersed across authorities. For example, in pri private sector banks, RBI will make a scheme and send it to government for approval and government will approve it, then a merger or amalgamation can happen. Public sector banks, of course, central government actually takes a decision when in consultation with RBI. In real rural banks, it's even more complicated. Central government has to consult with NABARD, state government, and the sponsor bank, which owns 15% of a regional rural bank. And then it can do an amalgamation of banks and that's an instrument that is given. Cooperative banks also, there is a complicated process of approval and there is only reconstitution and amalgamation power. So very limited powers and that too fragmented across authorities. NBFC is recently, there's been a reform done to the RBI Act to expand RBI's power to resolve failed NBFCs because we saw stress in that sector. And there was also a, a rules issued under the IBC to take systemically important NBFCs to resolution under IBC. It was not a, a ideal case because IBC is not designed for resolving such institutions, but uh, because, as I said, the reforms under, that were tried in 2018 failed, this was seen as a backstop, uh, as a plan B of sorts. Housing finance companies also, RBI has the power to file for binding up application in the Companies Act, but there's no extensive uh, resolution powers. I'll come to later what are the kind of powers that are missing when we look at other countries. In short, as there is more power than, say, banks and NBFCs. There are powers that IRDA has on approval of our central government to appoint administrator, to amalgamate and transfer businesses. The law also provides for central government to take over the undertaking of insurers. If IRDA recommends, then it accepts. Uh, in pension sector, uh, the PFRDA can recommend to government uh, appointment of an administrator of a pension fund or a record keeping agency, which keeps a record of the pensioners. And uh, that uh, uh, that's all that they can do as far as resolution is concerned. And in some of the laws like Payment and Settlement Act, which give uh, licenses of payment service providers, there is no mention of resolution, how to resolve a payment system. Very important pieces of financial market infrastructure like clearing cooperation do not have extensive resolution systems. While internationally we are seeing a lot of evolution in resolution regimes for these institutions, but in India we haven't caught up. And I should just also add that for banks, there is a deposit insurance system. It's not a resolution, but if a bank fails, then a depositor can get up to 5 lakh rupees uh, per bank. So if you have an account with <laughs> multiple accounts with bank, across those accounts you can 
get up to 5 lakh rupees of uh, deposit insurance cover if the bank fails now that's a quick overview of what the framework is and how, in what way is it lacking if you look at other countries and their experiences so i'll just quickly uh, give you an uh, overview in the paper it's all uh, detailed uh, much more um, clearly uh, first is that there is no clear trigger for resolution so it's really up to the re regulator to determine when to take the firm for resolution global trust bank the the regulator went on for almost a year trying to delay the resolution and ultimately the losses just kept piling up and it had to be merged at a very huge loss with the public sector bank uh second there is no rational framework for planning uh resolution and also re improving the resolvability of financial firms so one thing that we have seen since the global financial crisis in other countries is that there is there more powers to make a firm more resolvable to reduce the complexity of resolution so that when a firm fails it doesn't does not become the problem of the exchequer to pick the check it can be resolved and there are powers to rearrange the business to reconstitute it so that it can become more resolvable those are missing in india or or they have to be exercised in the general power that are given to the regulator uh, under under the laws then there are certain specific powers that are missing in india so uh, although in some laws there are powers to set uh, to move uh, to establish an administrator but to we there is no power to set up a bridge institution that can run the critical functions or can uh, manage the npas to, like a bad bank or uh, temporarily while a resolution is going on very importantly there is no power to internally recapitalize a firm so by writing down so when a firm goes bankrupt basically the definition is that the value of the assets is not sufficient to repay all the liabilities so one way to re internally recapitalize a firm is to write down some of the liabilities or to simply uh, write them off those powers have been included in many other jurisdictions but not in india also there are other powers like uh, putting a temporary stay on ter early termination rights that are there in many financial contracts those are not there in india and uh, there are some sector specific powers like run off for insurance which are also not there in india uh, then there are some safeguards uh, with, so when a resolution happens if the resolution leads to an outcome where you get less money than you would have got if the firm had gone into liquidation they then you should be compensated for that this is a safeguard that has been included in many other jurisdictions but it's not there in india and other similar safeguards are not there then there is a as i discussed earlier also there is a lot of reliance on direct and indirect bailout using public funds there is no principle that public funds usage has to be avoided and finally and i think most importantly there is no independent resolution authority in india it's all given to regulators and government in a fragmented manner and it leads to a certain kind of duplication of uh, capacity and it leads to a very difficult situation when you come to resolution of conglomerates and i as you know many of the large financial institutions now are parts of conglomerates icici group hdfc group you can name them and uh, sbi group but you if you multiple regulators are having these powers then how do you resolve a conglomerate it becomes a challenge uh, on this point of resolution authorities i'll just uh, give you a quick overview of how it's done in other countries it seems that more and more countries are moving towards setting up independent resolution authorities separate from regulator so uh, they can be a regulator for banking and <laughs> securities and insurance and so on but there is an independent resolution authority uh, which does the resolution part of it and in some countries it, the power is given to central banks but in almost all these countries central bank is a different form of financial sector regulator uh, in a couple of countries the power is given to financial regulators and uh, again in these countries there is no problem of multiple regulators like india has australia and switzerland have only one regulator for financial system so they have given the power to of resolution also to these financial regulators and in a couple of countries like japan and russia the powers are dispersed somewhat similar to what we have but more and more places the powers are given to one agency and more often than not it is an independent resolution authority it's something to keep in mind finally uh, the financial stability board which was an uh, agency set up uh, at the behest of g20 after the global financial crisis does a annual review of resolution systems across the world and in the latest review which covered 24 jurisdiction uh, india was uh, found to uh, to be the bottom of the pile it was 24th in terms of the uh, how extensive the resolution framework is and it, it, this is uh, talking about resolution for banks india has arguably the weakest uh, Uh, resolution framework for banks among the 24 jurisdictions that it looked at 
now government knows that there are these problems and many committees and commissions have over time seen these problems and recommended reforms in 2013 fslrc had recommended a comprehensive resolution framework in 2014 a working group that was uh, constituted with mem members from ministry of finance and reserve bank of india also uh, recommended a resolution capability of financial firms the same year ministry had constituted a task force for establishment of resolution corporation in india in 2015 in the budget speech finance minister announced that there should be a resolution law there will be a resolution law in 2017 this law was approved by the bill was approved by the cabinet uh, for introduction to parliament and it was introduced in the parliament and then for a year it was considered by a joint parliamentary committee and uh, it had many of these features of uh, resolution laws that i discussed earlier uh, pro a mechanism for monitoring planning uh, taking resolution action and so on uh, i will not repeat these but these uh, elements were included into the in the bill but there was a lot of opposition to the bill on some counts and uh, those counts were uh, considered to be strong enough to withdraw the bill back in 2018 and we should remember that this was the election year essentially this was a few months before the general election and government uh, i think got cold feet and decided to back down and when <laughs> it, uh, the fm submitted a uh, application for withdrawing of the bill he uh, at that time mr goel was the fm he uh, gave three reasons three specific apprehensions that need to be reconsidered and then the bill could be reintroduced first was the use of an instrument of bail in which i described briefly earlier second was that at that time the deposit insurance cover was only 1 lakh rupees and it was considered to be inadequate and uh, it had to be uh, reconsidered and finally there were apprehensions about inclusion of public sector banks into this under this law so theoretically if a public sector bank fails and this law is in place then it could be resolved under this law with even uh, if it involves privatizing the public sector bank the law had that kind of a, a, a power at least potentially to be used although government can was always free to recapitalize the bank and prevent such a eventuality for happen and one of the key sources of uh, pressure against this bill created by was by uh, public sector bank unions officers unions and employees unions uh, so after this uh, reform was thwarted uh, withdrawn interrupted government has tried to do some uh, patchwork reforms to deal with the exigencies of the last few years as we discussed the kind of failures we have seen in 2019 the rbi act was amended to give more powers to nbf rbi over nbfcs again in 2019 uh, the rules were issued under ibc uh, that allowed the financial firms that central government would notify to be covered for liquidation and insolvency proceedings under ibc and later central government 3 days later central government came out with the rules A, not a notification saying that systemically important nbfcs at the behest of rbi can be uh, resolved under the ibc and in 2020 just a few days ago banking regulation act was amended to give uh, rbi more powers of resolution over cooperative cooperative banks so that's where we are and now the question is <laughs> where do we go from here my paper argues that we need comprehensive reform but we are in the middle of a crisis and we need to think of a different strategy to get that reform done uh, but how do you deal with the crisis so i think based on the last 10 years of experience there are a few things to keep in mind first is very important to ensure uh, timely recognition of firm failures in 2011 uh, to 15 we kept delaying uh, recognition of bad loans and many of the firms were getting into deep stress it it kind of slowed down the credit cycle also and eventually government had to recapitalize many of these firms and banks and they put more than 3 trillion rupees into uh recapitalizing public sector banks and uh, if you if the timely recognition had been there then resolution or recapitalization or any other option could have been thought of second is that since right now in a moratorium time we need to plan and prepare for what's coming third is that even though once in a while you will need to use public funds to bail out some of these institutions it should be an optimal use of public funds in a crisis there is a stronger case sometimes to bail out financial firms especially those are systemically important but even then there is no this is not an infinite resource there has to be a cost benefit analysis done uh, fourth is that you need to have a proper legal framework in place as i discussed earlier to take the resolution action it, it is a source of resilience if you have the powers that are required to resolve if you have the kind of powers you have today you it is a very uh, fragile system because unless you can find a uh, suitable candidate for merger or amalgamation you can't resolve a financial firm and that's a problem 
and you need to think about scope of the resolution framework also like parts of the financial system are not covered with resolution like payment systems and all you should think about how to include these in july the rbi governor actually made this uh, these arguments and said that we need to set up a resolution cooperation there is no alternative and if the sooner we do it the better prepared we will be to deal with it so in my view a new law is required i mean a, a modified version of the law that had been thwarted by the political economy back in 2018 but the main challenge is that if you set up a new law and it will mean setting up a new agency as resolution of authority how will you be able to set up an agency in the middle of a crisis and deal with the crisis so i have suggested in my paper that when a law is passed initially the powers of planning resolu- improving resolvability and also resolution should be given to the regulators because right now anyway they have those some of the limited powers those powers should be expanded under the law simultaneously resolution cooperation should be set up which participate in partnership with the regulators on these uh, resolutions that happen in the next few uh, uh, m- months or year year and a half and after that through notification government can transfer these powers fully to uh, resolution cooperation it, the law can be designed in that manner so whenever you, the, it feels confident that the resolution cooperation is ready take over responsibility because eventually it is important to have a se- separate resolution authority giving this power permanently to regulators will not work in indian context as we have seen over the last decade because there is a lot of strong incentive to do regulatory favors and we have four regulators which makes it very difficult to coordinate in conglomerate uh, resolution simultaneously i think fsdc which is the council of ministry of finance and regulators should set up a working group or it could be uh, this function could be given to one of the existing working groups to uh, continuously monitor the uh, systemically important firms uh conglomerates and also interconnections uh between across financial firms because uh, many of the fam- failures will come because of interconnections the rbi financial stability report currently monitors some of this exposures of bank to nbfcs and so on and so forth this needs to be done on a more continuous basis now because we are in a crisis uh now finally uh, just briefly i'll just uh, talk about these three concerns that finance minister had raised about the original bill and how how they could be addressed to make this bill more acceptable uh, the first concern has already been ex- uh, addressed because the deposit insurance cover has been increased from 1 lakh to 5 lakh rupees and this now covers 98.3% depositors fully so only now almost all retail depositors are covered only some wholesale kind of company deposits are all not covered uh second bail in powers i believe the bailing powers are very important especially for stabilizing a firm when there is a financial crisis or if it's a complex firm which is not easy to resolve immediately <laughs> then it is useful but to make it more acceptable you could include only contractual bail in so only those instruments with a contract say that they bail inable could be bail in that's one option another option is to uh, limit the cancel or write off li- uh, uh, power Uh, through bail in to only equity so earlier the power actually included the, the ability to uh, write off a particular liability which is not just equity so that writing off through bail in should only be there for equity and for others it should only be write down to a i mean a junior form of claim uh, finally on inclusion of public sector banks i believe government should have the option of resolving public sector banks even if it means through privatization but the bill could be modified to make it mandatory to consult with government for any resolution action and if resolution action leads to privatization then it should be approval of government which was not uh, the case earlier but it should be given as a, a mandatory approval so these things could perhaps make the bill more um, palatable to the political economy i'll stop here uh, and i'll invite uh, my discussion dr saxena who actually was one of the architects of the original bill to uh, share his comments Dr. Safid, uh, thank you, Suresh, uh, for a very comprehensive uh, overview of the existing resolution framework for the financial firms and uh, what is the way forward. Um, so, before uh, supplementing your uh, presentation, I would like to give uh, a theoretical framework for a resolution and why resolution is necessary. and this needs to be uh, reiterated because uh, we need to build consensus so uh, let us start with the argument as to why the resolution uh, framework is necessary for financial firms 
so as you know uh, after the uh, global financial crisis uh, the policy makers and governments realized that uh, there is this uh, phenomena of too big to fail and this phenomena has actually created a lot of systemic risk in the system and uh, it also created moral hazard where the banks uh, were uh, uh, assured of a, a public bailout government bailout and then uh, they indulged into all kinds of risky activities there was no uh, no check on the risk and that is how the systemic risk as compared to the individual risk of a individual uh, financial firm the systemic risk for the entire financial sector actually increased and uh, what i am saying is is not just uh, i mean a plain statement if you see a paper by uh, uh, by uh, engel and ruan you will find that uh, they have uh, given the uh, the the way the systemic risk has evolved starting from uh, 2000 onwards and as you know the the uh, the institute their volatility institute in nyu they actually do the Uh, volatility analysis and systemic risk analysis on daily basis for more than a thousand uh, financial firms across the world, and India is also included. There are all almost twenty odd uh, uh, institutions in the financial institutions in that uh, in that uh, analysis in that group. So, uh, so uh, what was the response? The response was that th- there were uh, three major response. Uh, which you which we can uh, uh, characterize as too big to fail reforms tbt of reforms and the first one was that uh, the they tried to the policy makers and governments tried to uh, strengthen the capital uh, uh, capital framework for the banks the second one was that they uh, basically uh, tried to create resolution framework and uh, when i say resolution framework it's not just the resolution framework but it it is also supplemented by the resolvability assessments whether whatever we are doing whether this can actually be done in the case of crisis and uh, the uh, the third one was that there were several uh, regulatory and supervisory reforms where the regulation and supervision was tightened so the effect of all this was uh, that the and and there is a there is a finding of this uh, tbt of reform which has been uh, presented by fsb in the uh, evaluation report uh, of which i was also a member uh, and it is now at the consultation stage and i think uh, by early next year they are going to publish the findings and the findings are uh, Uh, uh i mean uh, broadly threefold uh, first is that these indicators of systemic risk and moral hazard have moved in the right direction and what do i mean by this uh actually the systemic risk as computed by uh, volatility institute that has declined the second is that the tpf uh, tbtf subsidy or what what, what we call uh, uh the uh the tbtf subsidy or the in, implicit funding uh, uh, sub, uh subsidy that actually has declined and in this connection uh, the the this uh, fsb uh, evaluation group has actually uh, not only used the secondary research but it also do, did uh, but it also did some uh, primary research using several models cds model a tbt of factor they also uh, created uh, 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 i mean they also use principal component analysis so there were four or five models that they actually use to look at whether the systemic banks have uh, uh, whether the uh, implicit uh, funding subsidy of these banks have declined or not declined and the broad conclusion is that the implicit funding subsidy has declined and it has declined uh, post uh, global financial crisis although in some cases 
the decline is not commensurate with the levels which were uh, seen before the global financial crisis so uh, but the thing is that the these indicators the indicators of systemic risk the moral hazard have actually moved in the right direction it's only because of the the three reform that i just uh, uh, pointed out and the they also uh, calculated the what is the net benefit to the society because as you know there are costs and there are benefits so what is the net benefit to the society and they have actually quantified and its quantification is only partial because they have only looked at the uh, at the capital levels of the uh, global cfes and also the uh, domestic cfes so uh, and and the to the calculation is that out of around 72 trillion uh, dollar of gdp of these uh, 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 g20 countries the uh, the the only the capital strengthening reform has resulted into a uh, uh, net benefit of around 155 151 billion usd and in this they have not looked at the resolution reform and what what is the uh, what is the uh, attribution to the uh, to the net benefits on account of resolution reforms uh, and but but the, there is some analysis done based again on the uh, on the uh, on the uh, systemic risk analysis done by uh, robert engel and timothy uh, uh, ruan uh, where they have said that uh, the if actually we constructed a resolution reform index which had three components one is the legal framework another is resolvability assessment and third is actual uh use of uh, tools like belen and uh, other other tools so the resolution reform index was actually uh, uh regressed on various uh, 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 uh parameters to see whether the resolution if the resolution reform uh, if there are good resolution reform in a country whether it reduces the uh, probability of crisis and for that we use the probability of crisis uh, measure given by romer and romer so uh, we found that uh, uh, the resolution reform index actually reduced the implicit funding subsidies and in effect it would mean that if there are good resolution frameworks in a country then it will actually reduce the uh, the probability of a next crisis uh, so uh, and and if you look at the data you will find that uh, uh, for for many countries uh, not india is not part of that but there are many advanced countries for which analysis was done and in fact uh, the uh, uh, angle and ruan construct a uh, systemic risk capacity measure and they say whether how much as uh, systemic risk is too much and they say that if this uh, prevents the uh, probability of crisis then and 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 the capacity is more than the actual risk then this country is safe and they found that uh, uh, in the recent period uh, i think the analysis goes up to 2017 or 18 and they found that the uh, the uh, systemic risk has declined so what i am trying to tell you is that there is a theoretical and empirical evidence which exists which says that if you have good resolution frameworks then you can avoid the probability of crisis next crisis and uh, this is true not just for a country this is also true globally because this the model that they have created is a global model so uh, i mean we need to reiterate and reemphasize why resolution reforms are essential okay so now coming back to the uh, existing uh, resolution framework you are right that uh, the fsb uh, progress report which evaluates the resolution regimes of various countries including india found uh, that the progress is uh, checkered and in some countries uh, i mean they, they assign uh, ratings also based on the what whatever is the so for this uh, resolution reform index that we created we actually gave a, a rating based on several components and the rating ra ranges between 0 to 
and for the world as such uh, the, uh, the this index is close to 0.6 percent uh, 0.6 uh, and but for India, obviously, the rating is uh, close to uh, zero. So because uh, uh, out of the 12 uh, key attributes uh, which you have talked about, uh, key attributes of effective resolution regime of FSB, uh, we are complying only on maybe four or five uh, attributes and on, on the rest of the uh, attributes, we are non-compliant. So uh, I agree that uh, what you said that uh, the the existing regime is fragmented it is incomplete it is ineffective and it is also uh, inefficient uh, uh, and now we have tried to uh, create uh, some some solutions which are also partial they are not comprehensive uh, so i think what we need to do going forward is to uh, look at this uh, problem comprehensively and do it in self-interest. I mean, not for, not because somebody else is telling or some committee has said. It's only because if we have a good resolution regime, our financial system would be safe. Uh, I think I will stop here. Thank you, Dr. Safina. It's uh, very good to hear from you. And I'll certainly add that evidence on the impact of resolution frameworks on the probability of systemic crisis. Uh, benefits, financial and monetary benefits of such frameworks into the paper as part of the literature review. And I'm glad that you agree that there's a problem and uh, it needs to be solved. And hopefully, I mean, sometime this year, if not or early next year, we will see some action on, on the legislative front also on, on, on this. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, I would like, we would like to take it. Okay, there's one question from Shohini. Uh, she's saying she wants to understand our views on the Banking Regulation Amendment Act 2020, uh, and especially given RBI's already strained regulatory capacity. And the other question she has is, if you think a twin peak regulatory model would be easier to achieve in India than a separate resolution authority. Uh, so let me uh, first try to address the, this question that on, on the Banking Regulation Act uh, the amendment. So yes, it is true that giving this uh, uh, this amendment actually makes uh, more demands on RBI and it will need to build capacity over time. However, the if you look at urban cooperative banks, which were regulated by RBI, <laughs> I, mean, regu I mean, not as intensively as a scheduled commercial bank, but they were regulated by RBI. Now having these powers uh, basically reduces the fetters that RBI had in resolving a bank when it knows that it has failed. And that requires only, I mean, marginal more uh, powers, I mean, uh, capacity, marginally more capa capacity is required to be able to use those powers. Earlier, the problem was that they didn't have the powers to resolve, even if they saw that uh, urban cooperative bank is going towards failure. So there is a benefit which is which can happen immediately, even without uh, building more capacity. But over time, if you want to make use of these powers, you need to build more capacity and strengthen basically the cooperative banking division within the Reserve Bank of India. So that's on uh, the first question, my take, and Mr. Dr. Sasina may want to add to it. Uh, the second question is on Twin Peaks model. So uh, if you can elaborate what you mean by it, because my understanding of Twin Peaks model is the model where potential regulation goes into one regulator and uh, conduct and consumer protection regulation goes into the other regulator. And then you can have a Twin Peaks model, but you can still have a separate resolution authority other than the Twin Peaks, which do the regulation, like in Australia they do. In Australia, the uh, there are two uh, different organizations that one one does a uh, conduct regulation, other does a prudential regulation. But you can still have a separate uh, uh, I mean, re resolution authority. Sir, do you want to add to this? Uh, no, I, 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 what I would like to submit is that the emerging uh, uh, empirical evidence is that the resolution authorities are specialized authorities. Uh, this is the this is the emerging uh, uh, evidence. I don't know whether uh, there is any uh, basis for this and whether we should adopt this. But this is the this is the evidence that resolution authorities are separate, mostly from the central banks and uh, also from the financial sector regulators. 
although in some countries you have central banks doing resolution but uh, if we need a comprehensive framework for uh, financial uh, resolution of financial forms i think uh, uh, one regulator uh, may not be sufficient i mean we can't assign a responsibility of uh, resolution uh, authority to uh, for, to a single regulator Okay, I think there was one more question, but uh, we okay. I can take it. Perhaps Bhargavi is asking: Do we know of any jurisdiction with an independent uh, resolution authority where the banking sector is owned by the state? I am trying to understand the incentives of the state to set up an independent resolution authority where the government owns a substantial chunk of the banking sector. So let me just answer that. There are only two major economies in the world where substantial banking sector is owned by uh, government, and the China and India. all others have moved away from this so uh, i mean we can't this is too too small a sample to make any kind of a, uh, the any draw any conclusions from but if you are, if i were to just use uh, rational choice and uh, think about the government's incentives today the government has no other option and having a resolution authority which basically in consultation with government takes a resolution action will expand the choice set of government government is still free to uh, recapitalize and continue the public sector bank as it is or it could use a resolution option i don't see what the downside for the government is just from a pure you know rational choice perspective so uh, I, I think we'll uh, bring this session to a, an end here, unless, uh, sir, you want to add something. Uh, no. Okay. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you for joining, and thank you for your uh, very insightful comments. And I'll certainly incorporate them in my in my paper, which is still the first draft. Uh, now we can we'll move to the panel discussion, which uh, uh, will focus on both these issues: financial sector bankruptcies and non-financial bankruptcies, but primarily focus on the IBC. uh the panel discussion will be moderated by rajeshwari uh, sen gupta uh, rajeshwari is an assistant professor of economics at igidr in bombay uh panelists are uh, pratik datta he is senior research fellow at shardula marchand mangaldas and company uh then anjali sharma she is a anjali is a research senior research consultant at the finance uh suharsh sinha suharsh is a partner in the finance practice at azb and partners uh the nikhil shah he is a managing director with alvarez and marshall uh, so i invite rajeshwari to please start the panel discussion thanks riyash uh, we 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 gain 4 minutes into the panel discussion because you have taken up 4 of our minutes uh so so with that caveat let me get started welcome everybody to the panel discussion uh before i move on to the panel i would like to request the audience uh please start sending in your questions from the start of the panel itself because what we'll do is once the panelists are done with the opening statements we will start uh, taking questions from the audience if there are any uh, and also when you're writing the questions it will be great if you could please mention which panelist the questions are directed to uh, so without further ado let's get started um so as uh, as is something that we already know is we are living in exceptional circumstances and the critical question now is as anirudh pointed out in his presentation is uh, how soon will ibc be revived from its suspension and uh, whether ibc can play a very important role as the indian economy struggles to recover from an unprecedented crisis i would like to request each panelist uh, we have four panelists i would like to request each of them uh, to give an opening statement where it will be great uh if in just three four points they could highlight their uh, they would share their thoughts on uh two main questions one is what in your opinion has been the most important lesson over the last three years that ibc has been in place uh about the effectiveness of ibc in terms of what works and what doesn't uh for example is it considered too creditor friendly 
uh, are the cases on average taking too long to get resolved uh, with not a good enough recovery rate to show for? Uh, and is it um, and despite the issues, uh, how does IBC compare with the other resolution and recovery mechanisms that are in place, uh, particularly in context of the, the current crisis that we are experiencing? And the second question is, based on the lessons learned, what in your opinion uh, is the most important change uh, both to the law itself as well as to the supporting institutions uh, that that can be done in order to make the IBC more effective uh, in dealing with a large scale, a large number of corporate bankruptcies that might uh, end up coming to the NCLT in uh, the next one year or so. So I would just go uh, in an alphabetical order uh, with first names. So uh, Anjali, uh, why don't you get started? And given the time constraint, I would request panelists to keep uh, keep their comments to about five, six minutes. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Rajeshwari. Uh, uh, first, thanks uh, Anirudh, Suyash, and uh, Carnegie India for inviting me to be part of this panel. Um, I haven't uh, attended a public event on IBC for a while, so I'm very happy to, to do that. Uh, thank you, Rajeshwari, for picking the name order. It's so good to be able to speak first, especially given the other panelists. And if I was last, I think they will say everything. And since they are, most of them are from the market, I fear that I would have had little to say. So thank you for uh, that opportunity. Uh, let me uh, uh, sort of make my comments in two parts. So let me comment on what was happening in IBC pre-COVID, and then perhaps I can come to the COVID question on so, you know what's sort of the way to think about IBC in the COVID world uh, uh, now. So what was happening in IBC? I would say that uh, on an assessment of the three years of IBC, it's brought reasonable certainty to the exit process for distressed firms. And to that extent, uh, it seems to be fulfilling the objective of an insolvency regime reasonably well. Uh, I think there's a vibrant ecosystem of insolvency stakeholders that's developed. I think I, IBBI and the participants in the system have sort of worked very well together and they've developed this orderly uh, setup of IBC functioning and that's something to, to be commended. Um, now, if we think of the scale of the problem that IBC started with, uh, I think there's a chart which uh, Suya sh showed about the financial sector NPAs and between banks and NBCs, NBFCs, I think that there are anywhere between 14 to 18 trillion rupees of uh, NPAs that existed or exist in 2018-19. And uh, even on conservative assessment, when I look at the numbers that IBBI puts out, it seems to me that around 10 to 11 trillion of that is either in IBC or is has already passed through IBC. So for example, if I take the sum of resolved and liquidated firms, I see that around eight and a half trillion has actually reached outcome. Now, even if I put some very conservative numbers on the 2200 that are still sitting in IBC, it looks like that a substantial part of financial sector uh, sort of uh, distress might already have come to IBC. Now, on the outcome of what has happened to this sort of 10 trillion that has come to IBC, it around eight and a half trillion has seen some outcome. Now, half of that outcome is that for around four and a half, four, four trillion of the claims, there seems to be a resolution. And against that four trillion of claims, there seem to be around 45% recovery, right? And that's the average recovery. If we look at the median recovery, which is leaving us out aside the extremities that we see, like one case which gave a stellar recovery, we find that the recovery rate is around 32%. Now, one might argue that that's not a very good rate, but we have to remember that much of the sort of the case volume in IBC actually might be coming from the 2012 to 2016 period and might have been a significantly stressed set of firms that came to IBC anyway. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Um, and perhaps when we say that a large number of firms have gone into liquidation, so there is a number of around 900 firms that are sitting in liquidation, uh, and I looked at the values of what size of firms these are. It looks like there are 70 firms in liquidation that account for 85% of the claims that have gone into liquidation, which means that there are these extra stressed firms from the sort of pre-IBC period that went to IBC, could not find a resolution outcome and hence have moved to liquidation. And then there are around uh, 800 odd small firms 
and there if you look at the numbers you see that around half of them have not received even a single resolution plan and there's something to worry about because we have made a sort of a conscious choice of excluding uh, sort of the promoter slash debtor owner by bringing in place things like 29a and uh, firms not getting a single resolution plan could be on account of two issues one of course is 29a and the exclusion of the debtor and the second is perhaps that firm is not uh, worth resolving and there is no incentive around resolution of that firm uh, the second set of numbers that i noticed and i found interesting is that recovery outcomes are much better for the smaller firms okay and when i classify a small firm it's a firm with claims of less than 100 crores up to 100 crores and there in fact the recovery rates are 55 to 60 percent and that appears to be because the sort of the gap between the assets that they hold and the debt that they have appears to be smaller so they seem to be closer sort of in sort of they seem to be much more rationally financed than the larger firms and again this could be a legacy of the past where we had a long period with restructuring and uh, uh, you know uh, schemes like cdr etc where we know that actual resolution was not taking place and more and more debt was getting piled up into stress funds uh, on timelines actually if you look at median timelines cirp is getting finished in 270 to 280 days the big question is what happens when a firm goes in liquidation and there i think there appears to be a little bit of a black box um, as to how long it takes to finally liquidate and close the process uh, i guess once more data starts emerging we'll know what's happening the other uh, thing i know i notice is that there is not much variation in the timelines by size of firm or by nclt bench and that suggests that there is a structural timeline set that has gone into the sort of the ibc timelines which is that either uh, the intensity of litigation remains the same across all sizes of firms or that actually 270 days is the rational timeline to resolve all types of firms at least the minimum timeline to resolve all types of firms i think that we need to think about timelines a little bit more carefully and examine them to see what's going on there um, it could also be an nclt capacity problem which is that the manner in which nclts are able to schedule cases is just leads to a 270 to 80 day timeline even for smaller cases um, the second thing i want to point out is the uh, the other thing that i want to point out is that in the first year of ibc we saw this rush of cases coming in which was from a previous regime so the first 400 cases that came to ibc in 2017 they account for around 5.5 trillion of the claims that are sitting in ibc the next 500 cases that came only account for around 2 trillion of the claims so perhaps there is a system which has dealt or is dealing with the past backlog that came is now settling down and once you know uh, that backlog gets cleared up the system will behave in a more rational way but the, even in the pre covid world there were many many problems and i and i'll just highlight some which i think were more troublesome one i think this debtor alienation is a huge issue but the thing that we need to be careful about is to move from an extreme of debtor exclusion to suggesting a debtor in possession model i think there is a mid path where things like repealing 29a or having a more rational approach to dealing with cooperative debtors needs to emerge so we shouldn't pick extreme positions saying that today's ibc is too creditor friendly and hence we should move to a debtor in possession model the second is i think we need to move to thinking about court capacity much more rationally i think that's one debate that needs to happen whether it's administrative capacity whether it's consistency in judgments whether it's bench capacity that needs to happen um i also think that we think we have tinkered with ibc too much we need to stop at some point and say we need to give certainty to participants and not change the law and rules every single sort of time there is a, a problem that we run into and finally we have to think about the distressed asset ecosystem more rationally i think interim financing is still not working in this country the arc exclusion that has recently come out is sort of bad news generally uh, now given all this context what do we do about the covid uh, sort of impact and here i would say that you know i find it puzzling that we had to suspend the ibc given that there was only a, uh, already a moratorium in place and also given the fact that 
uh, that moratorium kept getting extended for a long period of time. I, for some reason, we don't seem to believe that commercial wisdom will generate the same outcome that a state mandated action will. My sense is that given the moratorium, the flood of cases to IBC as people were expecting would not have happened anyway. The second thing I want to say is that there is no reason that why an RBI-led restructuring plan cannot coexist with the IBC. I see no reason why suspension of IBC has to take place for an RBI restructuring plan to be put in place. Both can coexist. In fact, they will generate a nice set of incentives for participants to pick one over the other rationally and also discipline participants. So the, the RBI restructuring mechanism suffers from all the issues that pre previous restructuring mechanisms have suffered from. And you can see that even the RBI is a little worried about that. So I suspect that bringing the IBC back on is the way to build rational incentives into the system and to ensure that there is a natural disciplinary system. Uh, there's no abuse of the restructuring mechanism that takes place. So I'll end with this. Uh, and later, if there are any questions, then we can take them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anjali. Uh, I think some of those are really thought provoking points and time permitting, uh, we'll come back to some of uh, these points again. Uh, so I'll turn to uh, Nikhil now. Nikhil, you've had a, a quite a bit of a hands on experience with IBC cases over the last few years. So uh, it'll be great to get the practitioner's perspective from you. And uh, I just want to mention here that this panel is great not only because of the wealth of knowledge and experience but also because all of them were involved in the drafting of the IBC in some form of the other uh, and uh, in the uh, preparing the rational document for the bankruptcy law reforms committee. So it's great to have this discussion with them because a lot of the strategy or policy thinking uh, that is coming up now is also based on the experience from 2015-16 when the IBC was uh, ideated on. Uh, so Nikhil, uh, moving on to you. Uh, Sure. Thank you, Rajeshwari, and thank you to the Carnegie Foundation for inviting me to participate uh, in this webinar. Um, so it's actually been quite uh, interesting to hear the different views uh, uh, of the different participants and uh, and also some of the debate uh, as well in terms of feedback. Um, so and um, I, and Anjali, I'm glad that you went uh, before me so that you could set the tone of uh, what's happened to the system. Uh, from, uh, from from the theory to the actual results uh, and, and with the different cuts as well in terms of small versus larger uh, sort of cases. Um, I, I think that um, from from my perspective, you know, having worked with uh, Rajeshree and the team actually that was part of the Bankruptcy Law Reform Committee, it's quite, um, you know, uh, exciting to see that uh, now almost uh, five years later, that um, that the, the law has been in action for about four years, just under four years, and um, one can debate, um, you know, how effective it is, and um, you know, um, I, I, but I think that at the end, at the end of the day, like, it is a massive change from what was uh, the situation before, and um, and that has had uh, very significant ramifications on the economy in terms of. Uh, growth in terms of the health of the banking system, in terms of um, how uh, creditors and debtors interact uh, with each other, and uh, and so I think that uh, it's been uh, you know very substantial uh, movement forward uh, in my opinion. Um, let me just um, give you the quick um, you know I think that there's um, you know a lot of stats that are thrown out like World Bank uh, ease of doing business in terms of um, you know recovery and timelines and and others. I think let me just uh, say that in most jurisdictions the uh, the performance of the bankruptcy system or insolvency system is is broken down into two uh, components, uh, which is the recovery uh, and uh, and the time frame to achieve the recovery. Um, and um, in in India, um, if you look at the data prior to uh, the bankruptcy code, you know, if you uh, believe the World Bank data, which I myself uh, I'm somewhat skeptical of, uh, the recovery rate was you know 25, 26 uh, percent pre IBC. And uh, if you look at the RBI kind of data uh, that's out there, it's uh, it is hovering between 14 to maybe 17 percent, uh, depending on the year, in terms of recovery. And then if you add in like things like loka dollars and DRTs, um, it's even much lower actually. Um, and so uh, th those are in the range of like three to kind of five percent uh, in, in those other uh, mechanisms of recovery. And so um, whether you take um, 
Anjali's uh, median num number of 32% or you want to take the overall system number of you know 46, 47% right now uh, as, of, as of June, uh, I think we can all agree that there has been a very significant improvement um, in whichever comparison you want to make, whether it's two times or three times uh, in terms of recovery and that you know has had a very large impact on, on capital actually. Uh, particularly in the from the banking sector that has take, has has had the windfall of achieving some of those recoveries uh, actually which they had largely written off um, uh, and and provisioned for and so that is good for all of us actually because it means that there's less money that the government has to pump into the public sector banks uh, or that private sector banks have to have to raise in the market. Um, but mostly because of the public sector banks, which are dominating the lending in India, um, it means there's less pressure on taxpayers, like uh, everybody here. And so um, that's a, a very positive change uh, in my view. The second, uh, in, if we look at the timelines, um, again, I think that the data is, um, is unclear, actually prior to the IBC, but um, I can tell you uh, anecdotally, um, the world, well, let me give you the World Bank number. It was, I think, four and a half, a little under four and a half years, uh, which in itself is a very long time. Uh, but anecdotally, you know, any people who are practitioners will tell you that, you know, on average, it must have been going on for at least eight, ten years, you know, in terms of uh, a, a particular resolution uh, to take place. And so um, I don't know how that four and a half year number has came about, but um, I, I think that um, most of the companies uh, did not find uh, a resolution actually. And and the, you have you know you can hear of cases that have been gone on for 10, 20 years as well, which obviously is not a very good uh, metric um, in terms of performance. Um, now, uh, whether um, you know taking into account all of the litigation, because I mean I don't think that there's a uh, if you really get into the the data and we've looked at it, it's um, the actual resolution process itself being run by the insolvency professional is actually largely being um, within the timelines of, of, of 270 days, actually. Um, where we are following astray is really on the um, issues that come up uh, with the NCLT and the other adjudicating authorities, uh, which take time. And uh, there is a whole host of uh, issues uh, that exists. I wouldn't just blame the issue uh, on the judiciary for not uh, performing. Uh, I think that the issue is actually deeper in that it's not only that there's not enough uh, judges uh, and potentially maybe the quality of the judges as well, but it's also because uh, we don't have uh, a, a good system of managing uh, the, the caseload. And we don't have uh, a system or, that is tracking it in real time in terms of uh, the next step. Um, and also posting, uh, you know, orders and, and everything that can be done, you know, online actually uh, can add tremendous efficiency uh, for everyone. Even hearings, actually, if you ask me, I think it's in, in a way the pandemic has the court system can actually really benefit if they actually do what everybody else is doing in the real world, which is uh, working from home and um, and actually doing virtual meetings. Uh, because what will that will force is that you have to have scheduled times uh, to show up uh, for hearings uh, versus having to go uh, and spend the whole day uh, in court in, in possibly a very tiny room that is overflowing with people. And uh, it's difficult to hear the judge or any of the, uh, you know, pellets, uh, the, the plaintiffs or any of the people actually, frankly, in this uh, process and, um, and actually understand what the argument that is being made. Um, and so if we, you know, and I, I'm also not very clear as to why the NCLT uh, system is only operating at 20% capacity right now. Why is it that they cannot operate virtually while all other courts and, and other businesses have, have moved in that direction? Um, it would really add um, a significant layer of efficiency uh, to, to the process. Um, and so I think that, you know, my feeling with it is that there seems to be nobody in charge, uh, actually, uh, with, with driving that uh, initiative. And uh, we've spent some time to try and understand uh, better what is the, what is actually the, the, you know, driving some of that. And in a, in a, hopefully maybe a couple of weeks we'll be releasing a white paper on uh, what some of the uh, causes are and perhaps what suggestions can be to try and address 
uh, the that situation. But I think that um, that's in my mind leading to um, uh, you know what uh, is ailing the system, which is that there's a lack of certainty about timelines and 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 there's a lack of certainty about some procedures uh, as well, and that uh, is causing creditors and investors uh, to hesitate to want to participate in in an insolvency process because investors you know uh, essentially think about uh, these things as do lenders by the way. Uh, in terms of time frame, because there's the concept of time value of money. And if uh, something is going to supposed to take six months and it takes two years, that can have a very uh, detrimental impact on, on the return. Not only return of their investment, but return of their time spent uh, as well uh, on it, because it's not certain that they will have the chance to invest uh, because of how, you know, they may be rejected as a resolution plan applicant. Somebody's offer may be better, but they may have spent a lot of time and money on on uh, on doing the due diligence of, of that asset and putting the bid together and the plan together and then only to find out uh, it's taken an extra year and a half or longer and uh, and that they've lost and so imagine what a wasted uh, you know their time you know, uh, how they think of their return on time uh, and so I think for those reasons um, it's very important actually that in my mind this is the most critical issue. Uh, that is actually affecting the system right now, and um, I, I think that uh, all of the people here and uh, and in the ecosystem need to band together to work uh, and provide these recommendations strongly to the judiciary, the Ministry of Corporate Affairs, and other and IBPI and others who may be involved in this process because it is imperative that we fix this problem. I'm not saying that I think that the process should take 330 days or whatever the time frame is but it should take um, a reasonable amount of time. And, and there should be some certainty uh, around what that time is. And there's some very simple things that can be done to achieve that. Um, I have a lot of other points, but I feel like I've already spoken for the allotted time. Um, and, and so I, I just wanted to make this one major point. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nikhil. We will hopefully come back to you, time permitting, to hear some of your other points. Uh, so Prateek, let me turn to you now. Um, uh, could you please share your opening remarks? Thank you. Thanks, Rajeshwari. Uh, thanks, Anirudh, uh, Suyash, and Karni India for inviting me. Uh, so I'll just uh, you know go back to the very basics and start off with a bit of a conceptual uh, framework and try and understand what's been happening over the last three, four years since the enactment of IBC, uh, just to uh, uh, put the discussion in some context. So. Uh, Conceptually speaking, all the problems that you see, it's easier to classify them under two buckets. One being the value destruction problem and the other being the wealth transfer problem. What uh, in this space, a lot of, you know, it's a highly interdisciplinary space. So you have a lot of economists and lawyers working. But what is interesting is that uh, the value destruction problem is mostly talked about by the economists, while the wealth transfer problem is essentially what concerns the lawyers because most litigations arise from there. Right. So now it's first uh, you go to the value destruction problem. Okay, as I said, uh, because economic theory has a lot of discussion on this, uh, the basic review of the economic theory suggests that under certain circumstances, super majority of financial creditors may not have the right incentives to preserve, preserve going concern values. Right. Now this is an inherent uh, uh, limitation in the IBC that because we are giving a supermajority to financial creditors and under certain circumstances they don't have an incentive to actually turn around the business then would that not lead to more liquidation right now yes that's a limitation but on the other hand we could make the system more sophisticated but that would also require higher judicial capacity and as Nikhil pointed out that's a limitation so a lot of the economic literature already provides for solutions to improve the uh, system so as to reduce the value destruction problem, but that is premised on higher state capacity. So when you do not have that higher state capacity, uh, it becomes a question of trade-off that, okay, we can't improve the judicial capacity, so you know what, we have to live with some amount of value destruction. Right. So that's one problem that we will see and therefore uh, some amount of uh, value destruction through liquidation etc will probably be the consequence of that. Uh, the second part on the value destruction problem is uh, the cross-class uh, cross cram down provision that applies post-insolvency. 
that essentially uh, limits the application of the IDC framework pre-default. And that's a problem because if you are looking at restructuring, and this is what Anirudh has been talking about, that if you really want to save the value, you should allow the debtor to use the restructuring framework before they actually default, right? So that is currently possible under, say, the RBI's framework, but not under the IBC framework. And that remains a fundamental limitation of the IBC framework, right? So these are two fundamental uh, design choices that were made in IBC. Obviously, there were certain trade-offs that were struck, but they will inherently have some value destruction implications, right? Uh, now, coming to the wealth transfer problem, and this is a problem that we have seen in most of the litigations. If you take the home buyers case, right, that is essentially a fight between one class of creditors vis a vis the financial creditors, right? So it's a trans, it's a question of extraction of wealth by one set of creditors over and above another set of creditors, right? Similarly, you see this problem in, uh, you know, at the standard chart bank case where there was this entire uh, discussion about whether secured and unsecured traders should be treated equally or not right so this is one area which has generated a lot of litigation and well there are a lot of i mean this is usually a litigated subject in any jurisdiction under insolvency law but what is kind of unique and that struck me uh, as far as IDC is concerned is that if you really look into the structure of IDC, IDC is designed for going concern sales, right? It is not really meant for restructuring. And I, I'll just give you an, a, you know, an argument to substantiate this point, right? If you want uh, the claimants, the existing claimants of the business or the company to restructure their claims vis-a-vis -vis the company and essentially end up with the restructured capital structure, why would the law force the resolution professional to invite bids from external parties, right? So the essential design of IBC, the essential choice of IBC is that there's a presumption that what we need to do is to sell the company to a third party or sell the business to a third party, right? So the entire structure of IBC is based on a going concern sell uh, model. It's not really meant to facilitate restructuring. And in the times of COVID, this is one thing that has really become uh, critical. And I'll give you some statistics. It's a new paper has come out from uh, Harvard University along with Illinois. They've done joint study on the number of applications in bankruptcy in US, uh, corporate insolvency in US from March to August. What we see is that chapter seven applications, which are for liquidation, have gone down by 25% as against 2019 figures. But chapter 11 figures, which are for restructuring, have gone up by 50%. So this clearly shows that in a COVID time, in a kind of situation, in an economic stress situation, market players or corporates would want to go for the restructuring framework. Now, the limitation, as I said, in IBC is that it does not provide for the restructuring framework, right? So there is an inherent problem with the basic design philosophy of IBC that does not render it uh, you know, useful in a COVID kind of situation. So if you look at all the other countries which have suspended uh, IBC uh, you know, insolvency proceedings, uh, they usually also have a restructuring framework, right? So the incentive structure there is slightly different. And what we should instead look at is countries that have uh, suspended or delayed involuntary uh, filings rather than voluntary filings because the German example that I would get what was essentially uh, a, a voluntary uh, proceeding that was suspended but involuntary proceeding has been suspended in India Singapore Australia and Spain and what is interesting about the Singaporean example is that they really don't suspend the proceeding what they do is they extend the threshold uh, in terms of the pecuniary threshold and also the statutory demand notice time period. So the time for repayment is essentially increased by law. So essentially what they have done is a de facto restructuring by changing the repayment terms of a contract, right? So broadly then, these are the you know two frameworks through which we can look at the post-COVID situation. Uh, the other two points that uh, I think have emerged, uh, I mean, they were also uh, issues 
tips pre uh, pre covid and also now one is regarding improving the liquidity in the ibc market right now as anjali said 29a is a limitation but recently the problem that we have seen vis-a-vis -vis arcs i think what we are seeing now is that there are a lot of pre ibc institutional mechanisms which were designed with the viewpoint that there is no market for corporate control of distressed firms and they were meant for that ecosystem now we have moved from that ecosystem into a market based ecosystem and yet those institution remains the way they are and naturally that is conflicting with the ibc framework so the example that anjali gave of the restriction uh, that uh, ARCs apparently have regarding participation in IBC. We need to remove those restrictions, and this uh, would essentially mean that we think of converting the ARC model into more of a private equity model, and thereby improving the liquidity in the IBC market. Uh, the last point, and this relates to uh, Suyash's, uh, you know, uh, presentation on the application of IBC to FSPs. I think there are some fundamental problems when you extend the IBC framework to FSPs, right? Because the entire IBC framework, as is evident from the preamble, from the auction mechanism, etc., is to maximize value, right? Value maximization is the essence of IBC. Whereas the primary objective while resolving FSP is not value maximization, but financial stability. And these are completely different goals. So if we are trying to put FSPs under IBC, that may not quite work out because the entire purpose of IBC is very different from the purpose of a resolution framework. There are uh, several other uh, distinctions, but one thing that Suyash mentioned, and I think that's a very important point, is regarding uh, you know one of the uh, issues about FRDI bill. Pratik, I'll the... just have to cut you short a bit because uh, you're almost up on your time. So if you just keep it very brief now. Thank you. Sure, sure. So on the contractual bail-in, I think the confusion now has been completely removed because the Madras High Court has recently given a judgment uh, in the Yes Bank case where they clarified the RBI's powers to come up, uh, you know, to, to, to essentially bail in the 81 bonds. Now with that, it is clarified that contractual bail-in is possible. So I think that aspect of the FRTI bill has been clarified. So uh, that no more is a controversy. Uh, thank you. With that, I think uh, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you so much, Pratik. Uh, uh, so, Harsh, over to you now. Uh, uh, you are coming on uh, last, but I would really request you to keep your comments brief, and then we'll have opportunity again, hopefully, to do one more round of discussions. Thank you. Hi, hi, Anish. Sorry, I'm trying to switch on my video. Yeah. Sure, okay. sure. Uh, thank you, Arishri. So good to see you. It's been ages and, and good to be on this panel with so many friends and colleagues and, and hopefully a client in, um, in Nikhil. But um, so, you know, I think there are lots of topics I want to cover, but I'll, I'll keep it brief. So I, I think the overall message I'm going to start off with is by saying that I think IBC is working quite well. I won't go into the reasons why I think it's working quite well. Given the paucity of time, I think I'm going to be constructive and I'll focus on the issues which I find in IBC. You know. So I'll start off with that headline statement that you know I'm here to praise IBC, not to bury it. But um, I'll just go into some of the issues which I think are, are uh, quite rife um, uh, at present and how I think we can address it. So I start off with one of the comments which Anjali made right in the beginning on the recovery rate uh, and whether or not that's a good gauge, uh, good parameter to see how well IBC is working. So I think, I think in my view, the fact that recovery rates may be low uh, by itself, I don't think is a good indicator of how well or how badly IBC is working. I think the point is, is IBC is leading to true worth, true realization of worth of those underlying companies. Uh, if the worth of a certain company leads to an 80% haircut, so be it, as long as that 20% recovery is truly what that company is worth. And over there, I think, where we are faltering is that even though it may be worth 20%, but that 20% is taking not one year, but one and a half or two or three years for recovery to take place. Therefore, the true worth is getting eroded because the IRR is going down. So I think that that's that's uh, one point I want to make on, on um, Anjali's uh, uh, initial thoughts. And secondly, when you're talking about recovery, uh, I'm not sure whether we should be looking at recovery as a percentage of the outstanding debt or outstanding secured debt or as a percentage of the liquidation value of the company. 
So I think, you know, I, to be honest, I, I, I don't have a conclusive view, uh, but I feel that given that the company is in distress, uh, maybe the liquidation value of secured creditors must maybe a better uh, uh, metric to look at when you're looking at recoveries. Uh, so that was just something interesting I found Anjali's presentation I uh, talked I wanted to speak about. Now I'll just briefly go through three or four issues which I find in IBC, especially given where we are right now in COVID. So first of all, uh, I think as Pratik rightly said, IBC has become less of a restructuring mechanism and more of a takeover mechanism. And the, I think the chief reason for that is how 29A is structured. So uh, in my view, 29A, uh, there is scope to trim down 29A because it has both fault-based as well as non-fault-based disqualifications. So one of the key disqualifications is if you happen to be a non-performing asset. Right? Now, that's something which could happen not because you have indulged in malpractices, but because the economy has been such or because your genuinely good business decisions did not turn out the way you expected them to turn out. So I think that if we can scrap out that one element of 29A uh, and the remainder continues, I have strong feelings about the remainder as well, but I think let's let's talk about what is politically and, and palatable. So I think that's something where, where a reform can be made. So at least promoters of companies which are currently suffering have a good way of getting back into their companies and doing a, a, a genuine restructuring as opposed to a change of control. Uh, secondly, I think where there's scope for improvement is where government departments have been acting as litigants in various cases. Uh, we, saw, we saw that with the ED, with the Enforcement Directorate in the Bhushan Power case, uh, even though there was an amendment to the IBC, Section 32, Capital A came along, which basically said that for all previous sins committed by the older promoters, uh, the new incoming promoter shall not be saddled with any liability. But in spite of that, I think ED is pursuing that case. Uh, secondly, we have seen how Department of Telecom in ARCOM as well as Aircel uh, is... Uh, you know, is hanging on to that thread to say that uh, Spectrum is a sovereign asset and should not be handed over to the new bidder. Uh, we've also seen RBI's view vis-a-vis -vis, uh, ARCs being act acting as resolution applicants. Uh, in, in DHFL, where we are personally involved, uh, you know, we are advising the administrator in DHFL, uh, National Housing Board, uh, is, is, which also happens to be a regulator, has, is at loggerheads with uh, RBI trying to say that they have a priority over payouts over other creditors. So I think the list is quite long, but the short point is where there is a legislation passed by the parliament, uh, where one or two ministries of the government are piloting it, it just doesn't hold very well if other departments, other regulators are challenging it, and that too to elongate the process. So I think there needs to be some coordination among government departments. Um, the next point I'll quickly touch upon, especially given the, the, the high proportion of liquidations, uh, and I think, again, maybe Anjali, I think I touched upon that. I think the new uh, uh, fashionable orders that we are seeing in NCLT is liquidation as a going concern, which uh, I think by definition is an oxymoron, because the reason you could not restructure is because it's no longer a going concern. And therefore, to saddle the liquidator with this going concern responsibility, I think is quite onerous. Also, because... Uh, by definition, the only legal framework available is uh, a scheme under the Companies Act, which is even in good times, people didn't resort to it. In liquidation, you know, you can imagine how difficult it is to resort to it for various reasons. Primarily, it has a class of creditor concept, and each class needs to be uh, uh, vote in a certain manner to be able to cram it down. And also because even equity holders have have a, a vote in in uh, a scheme of arrangement. So that's something I think. Um, um, needs to be removed from the regulations and NCLT judges as a matter of practice should stop ordering that, you know, that liquidation must be attempted as a going concern. Uh, last, I'll, I'll just touch on one more point, which is the delays that we are seeing in NCLT. So I think one big reason why we are seeing delays, uh, particularly in the NCLAT, and uh, I've made this point previously and, you know, I may be held in contempt for this, but I think the problem is that NCLAT judges often tend to be ex-Supreme Court judges, right? And ex-Supreme Court judges are used to using the Constitution, and the Constitution has Article 142, which has inherent powers, uh, which is being misused, as we can see now, in the interest waiver case. Uh, so I think they come with the baggage of, of having Constitution as a tool, and they use that baggage when they come to NCLAD. Uh, I think we need judges need to understand that they do not have inherent powers, 
to do what they feel subjectively in their mind is 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 uh, equitable and just uh, it's a commercial tribunal at the end of the day and what is just and equitable in a commercial context is purely predictability and certainty in my view and not uh, subjective notions of of how a particular creditor should be prioritized or somebody else should give a higher uh, payout to others uh, so i think that that mindset change needs to happen secondly uh, the the one more reason for delays is the high amount of inter creditor disputes now i feel inter creditor disputes should not stall a resolution you know so we have seen one very good precedent in ruchi soya uh, where there is an inter creditor dispute but the banks decided that you know what let's park this issue aside let's put the disputed amount in escrow but let the resolution go through let change of control happen so we saw patanjali take over ruchi soya but that's an exception i think we need to see a lot more of that um uh, and the last point i'll 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 quickly make is um rival bidders they are the next source of litigation the, the bankruptcy board has recently amended regulations to say that all legally compliant plans need to be put for vote earlier you only put for vote the highest bidder now you need to put all compliant plans for voting uh which is helpful because the losing bidder would always complain earlier saying that fine i may have made a a a lower offer but the least you could have done was put my plan up for vote so that's something which bankruptcy board has now mandated even if the h2 is a very poor bid you put it up for vote at least it's it's out in the open that both ran in the race and somebody came second legitimately uh so that i think is a positive development and um uh, i think i may be running out of time but one one last word i want to put in on on personal guarantees is i think that you know um uh, the the fact that personal guarantors have been brought into the ambit of personal insolvency i think that's a great move uh, notwithstanding the stay given by the delhi high court let's see how that pans out in the adil amani case but i think what's happening now is that bankers are scrutinizing personal guarantees a lot more carefully personal uh, promoters are not dishing out personal guarantees as they used to earlier as you know as if it did not matter uh, and banks are actually looking at cash flows of the company its its productive capacity as opposed to how uh or, or whether or not a personal guarantor is is giving a guarantee uh so sorry i i tried to cover a lot in a short span of time but those and and i stopped with that thank you so much harsh in fact you preempted a question that i already had for you on the personal guarantee point uh, but i think this was very comprehensive so thank you all so i'll just come back i'll do one more round with all of you guys before looking at the audience questions because we're just getting one of the one or two questions from the audience so i'll go back to anjali now um so one common point that i have for all of you guys is that the way i look at it the way all of us would look at the way ibc has evolved over the last 3 years is that if i if i think of the political reform or political uh, economy or the mindset of it that we are sort of swinging between two extremes on one hand we are using ibc to sort of punish the crony capitalists and we brought in section 29a well very early on in the life of the law and thereby kills a large chunk of the resolution plans on the other hand we are very sympathetic towards the borrowing firms and the moment there are a large number of liquidation cases there are headlines that you know with bleeding hearts that oh no many firms are getting liquidated people are losing jobs and ibc has a liquidation bias so we sort of keep on swinging between these two extremes and then finally when push comes to shove when we are hitting up the crisis of all crises we of course set ibc aside and we turn to rbi for restructuring something that we did 5 years back at a time when ibc was not there but now ironically we have ibc but we still refuse to use it and we are turning to rbi and that to me in a nutshell summarizes the way uh, the political economy of ibc is running despite the fact that ibc may be working well recovery rates may have gone up timelines may have still gone down from the past cases so i would like to hear from you guys what are your thoughts on this you know all said and done we keep discussing what we do but then um the finance ministry decided to set aside ibc and we really don't know when it's going to come back so anjali uh, uh, let's start it let's start with you what do you think about this so i think that uh, this can just interject just a layer on on top of that do you think it's because ibc is intrinsically viewed as a very creditor friendly law and right now all our sympathies are with the borrowing firms who have got a really raw deal yeah so i think that we have seen uh, multiple historical occasions where sympathies have stayed with firms uh but and then there is the end of that cycle where we see a great deal of punishment being meted out to the same firms for overborrowing i think we have we have a uniquely set up system uh, where uh, 
we have sympathies for the firm in a non transparent environment so where we want to privately restructure opaquely give money to banks i think we are very sympathetic and we don't have to provide capital we'll get provisioning benefit but the moment we move into a world of disclosure and transparency we want to punish and i think this is a dangerous uh, tendency and we need to think about this uh, the political economy of this tendency a lot so you know every rbi restructuring mechanism functions as a bleeding heart for bachao in bicharon ko but ibc when it comes to bankruptcy we want 29a right and i think this conundrum is to be explained to some extent by the opacity versus the transparency uh, logic so you know rbi restructuring doesn't make news in terms of promoter has run away with taxpayers money right um, versus ibc makes that news. so i think we have to worry about and but i do think that this is all a peak and trough cycle so the peak of this cycle is where we are sympathetic to firm and the trough is when we punish the same promoter so i think there's a lesson to be learned even by promoters on you know taking too much of largesse from banks under restructuring process thanks anjali and yep. i also think that you know we keep referring to this as rbi restructuring but technically it is an rbi forbearance scheme you know i mean all that the rbi is essentially doing is giving forbearance to the banks and not let them declare npa and then the banks can reschedule payments whichever way they want and technically that could have been done within the ibc as well rbi could have said give the forbearance within the ibc framework yeah except and that in ibc what would happen is that the owner would lose control and i think there's a lot of the lobbying going on to let the owner see i think displacement of what i called debtor alienation earlier i think we have set it too hard in stone uh they, we had an opportunity to not set it as firmly in stone earlier and i think we have just lost that so unless that is reversed you know suspension of ibc etc is just a natural outcome of that choice that we have made uh so nikhil you mentioned a lot about the the nclt capacity and you know we are all getting a crash course in digitization and the nclt judges also need to learn from that and make the best use of of this opportunity but if i can just take your attention more towards the law itself as anjali also mentioned that do you perceive the law as something that has gone too much towards the creditor friendly side because remember even when we were drafting the concern was if we leave it if we if we leave the debtor in possession then there could be malpractices you know there could be uh, stripping of assets etc and sort of this was a guard against that kind of a thing but now it seems that it has been interpreted in such a strong extent that that could be acting against the law so whenever uh, the when the law could play a very important role we have sort of uh, made the law defunct uh, so what is your views on that so um i actually just wanted to respond to the earlier question that you had for anjali as well and um i would um you know recommend to everybody that they read um you know the ibbi puts out an annual publication i think it's called perspectives or something of that nature and um and there's a very interesting article in that uh, publication which has been written by uh, injeti shrinivas who was just recently uh, moved on as the secretary of the ministry of corporate affairs and the and the story is is a, is a personal account of how 29a came to be uh from uh, I, i think it was his second day on the job and he narrates what all was involved in um how that how that uh, particular amendment came uh firstly as as an ordinance and then as an amendment and what all was involved uh, in it from from his perspective and the government's perspective and they and they really believed actually that um that there was a lacuna in the in the ibc uh which allowed would which would allow um the the sponsors or promoters of these companies to misuse the law and uh, in which case the the amount of time that the brc the parliament and everybody else uh, various committees on implementing the code would be would have been wasted and um and so we it's it's quite interesting actually and you know the i think the point that you're making and anjali is making is actually a very valid point and that that the pendulum you know moves and that pendulum moves relative to what's happening in the environment uh, economically politically um mm. and uh, and accordingly um, the those sentiments translates into how the government is viewing a particular piece of legislation and how they want to pursue it or or not pursue it uh, to the strictest and so um in today's environment the um, pandemic obviously has not been caused by um any of the borrowers 
Um, one can say, some people say it's China, um, but I, I'll leave that for another day. Um, it's uh, the fact is, is that um, we have a situation and because uh, of that situation, companies' cash flows are down and they're not able, they may not be able to service their debt. And if they're pushed into an insolvency in India, that means that basically the equity sponsors of that company or promoters will lose the value, uh, their value in the, and control of the companies. And is that a fair thing to do when they really haven't caused uh, the problem uh, at all? And, um, and so accordingly, the response of the government has been that let's suspend this uh, system for uh, the time being. Uh, and also, I think the, some of the background to that is that there's a huge backlog of cases uh, as well, right? I think the last count was some 12, 13,000 applications of which, um, you know, um, I think 9,000 are pending. Uh, to be admitted. Uh, this is pre-COVID. <laughs> and so uh, suddenly if we were to have um, thousands and thousands of more applications, which obviously would be the case in this environment, uh, we would have a much greater strain on an already very strained uh, system. Um, and, and, and then if, if they were admitted, it, would it really be fair for these people to lose their companies uh, for something that they really haven't done? They haven't borrowed, they haven't stolen, they haven't done whatever the finger pointing stuff that uh, is involved in it. And so I think that it's important that um, we take that into context. And I think that the pendulum is swinging back to uh, maybe more debtor uh, oriented control. And I believe that there's some uh, amendment related to uh, pre packs that is coming. Uh, obviously, the prepack can't be done by the creditors. It has to be done by by the debtor, and um, and I hope that that turns out to be a, another effective mechanism to to address the the stress. Um, coming back to your question, your question was sorry, for me. No, so my question was very similar. That you know, uh, yeah. is, is the IBC getting viewed as too much of a creditor friendly law, and that is why the government almost feels compelled to not bring it back in despite the fact that we have been seven months since the lockdown, things are, everybody, as, as Anirudh also mentioned, you know, and Susan mentioned that by now we have a sense of which sector has been affected, which has not been affected. So if we could have brought back IBC now, but we seems to be, uh, we seem to still extend the suspension. And I, I, think the that, I personally think that they, they need to, they do need to restart uh, it, actually. Um, I don't know how effective it will be because of the uh, large backlog. Um, that is in place. And so, um, but, you know, we, it, that pressure needs to be there, actually, uh, for, uh, and the ability to reorganize through this mechanism uh, as well. And it is, um, it, it is uh, shown to be an effective mechanism, as we spoke earlier. Um, I think it does need to be improved, and there are ways that it can be improved, but stopping it isn't probably yeah. the best way. Because uh, 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 the, the point is that, you know, whatever the RBI is doing, which is restructuring a forbearance mechanism, that is not going to resolve these firms. I mean, some no, of these firms will it. probably be able to come out of it. They'll be able to repay the banks. But many firms in sectors like hospitality, aviation, whose fundamental business model has changed, they will not really get resolved as a result of RBI. So for that, we need the IBC sooner rather than later. That's right. That's right. Okay. Thank you so much, Nikhil. Thank you. Uh, Pratik, turning on to you, uh, thank, thanks a lot, Nikhil. Uh, so Pratik, you made a very important point that the, R that the IBC is not really designed for restructuring. And typically in a systemic crisis like we are experiencing right now, uh, obviously the first instinct is to get the firms restructured because there is this difference between financial distress, economic distress, and you don't want the firm to be stripped of control, lose management, and go into the IBC process. So I thought that was a very interesting point. So do you think that had hypothetically speaking if section 29a was not there and if we had a carve out or a model where the debtor remained in possession in case of the voluntary debtor filings would that have worked better in favor of ibc uh, or or even would that would not have helped yeah certainly that would have worked but uh, let me just clarify uh, the point that i made so not only is it that it's not designed for restructuring but what it is designed for is not really also for sale properly because what has happened in IBC is that a lot of provisions that actually appear in the restructuring chapter in bankruptcy code in US has been copy pasted into a sale transaction chapter. So for example, 
the minimum liquidation amount is to be paid to descending creditors is a provision that is used in a restructuring law. However, in a sale transaction law, you don't need those provisions. There are a lot of provisions like that which have been put in the IBC, which actually should appear in a restructuring law, not in a transaction for sale law, right? And that has caused a lot of confusion and litigation. So not only do we need a separate chapter for restructuring, we also need to streamline the chapter on sale because a lot of the uh, provisions that are there uh, are actually taken from chapter 11 and they don't really gel with a sale transaction, right? So that's, I think, a fundamental problem. And yes, so restructuring chapter has to be an additional, uh, you know, uh, so in input. A, if I understand correctly, you are, you are sort of supporting what Anirudh said in his presentation that we need a chapter 11 kind of a separate uh, section altogether to enable this debtor triggered restructuring to happen. Absolutely. So uh, because without that, uh, you know, you can't blame RBI for coming up with uh, the restructuring framework because IBC is really not providing for it. So and also the suspension, you can't blame the uh, policy makers for suspending it because clearly IBC is not going to give you the outcome that a chapter 11 in US can give during COVID. Right. So given those circumstances, uh, I think, uh, you know, IBC would not have been able to solve it. I mean, I don't see how IBC would have been able to solve it uh, if the demand is for restructuring and not for going concern sales. That's great. Thank you so much, Pratik. So I'll just move on to Suhash. Uh, Suhash, do you have anything to add to this? If not, there is an audience question for you and then I'll just directly go to that. Do you have anything to say about this fact that is IBC viewed too creditor friendly and there needs to be a separate chapter 11 kind of section to enable the voluntary data filings to go into a restructuring without section 29A so that IBC can be more effective in a systemic crisis like now. I, I still feel the fact that IBC is creditor friendly, I think that's still desirable. Uh, there need to be certain limits and checks in place, which I feel is a small amendment to 29A. I think that should suffice. Uh, because in, in, in our experience, I mean, you know, I think it's very easy to forget how things were before IBC came along. I mean, let's not forget the fact that BIFR, SICA, the debtor in possession model in India has just not worked for various reasons because of information asymmetry, because of uh, non-diversified shareholding, the amount of power the promoter wields, etc. So I, I still feel credit in possession model is the way to go in India, but I think it needs to be tempered with a little bit more of pragmatism. Okay, fair enough. Uh, uh, there's a question for you from the audience. I'm just going to go to that. Uh, Ganesh Gopalakrishnan asks about, uh, uh, with respect to IBC and the FSP rules 2019, we have not yet seen a stipulation either by the IBBI or any of the sectoral regulators mandating a contractual recognition clause, uh, such as is incorporated in foreign law governed law, loan and security documentation to recognize resolution action initiated in India. So what it's saying is in absence of this, given that offshore creditors could independently pursue enforcement actions abroad without being bound by the moratorium imposed in India, uh, that is a problem that is quite serious. And do you think a contractual recognition would solve this or something else is required? I think it's a very uh, important question. So uh, I think the, one of the problems with the FSP rules is that it was, first of all, it was meant to be, at, I think it, it may have been discussed at length before uh, I, I logged in. But I think we all are aware that it was supposed to be a, a temporary stopgap mechanism. It's it's a very ad hoc sort of thing to deal with the crisis which was brewing in DHFL at that stage and possibly a few other uh, uh, HFCs. Um, so I think the problem is that only the Reserve Bank of India, only the regulator can take a company into bankruptcy if it's a financial service provider. Right? Um, we recently saw that Bank of Baroda wanted Reliance Capital to be taken into insolvency, but the RBI said no. So unfortunately, now the Bank of Baroda and the other creditors are in a vacuum. They don't know what kind of enforcement action they can take against uh, a major NBFC or, or, or NHFC. So I think I, the, the point is, 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 is well made. I, 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 I don't have an answer, but I think that the concern is very valid because if you happen to be, forget foreign creditor, even if you happen to be an Indian creditor, there's nothing preventing you from uh, using SARFAC or any of the other tools to recover against this particular entity, but you can't use IBC because that is only the RBI's preserve. Um, and secondly, assuming uh, uh, IBC has been initiated against uh, DHFR or any other HFC, the fact remains that if you are a foreign creditor, uh, the Indian bankruptcy order will not be recognized abroad and you are free to take any enforcement action that you want to. So this does lead to um, a split uh, between uh, jurisdictions and between forums, which is not ideal, but 
unfortunately, there is there is no answer at, at, for the time being unless we have a comprehensive resolution mechanism for FSPs in place. But just curious, have we seen any anything like that happen in the last few months? Uh, uh, that a foreign creditor is taking a, a company to court at a time when moratorium has already been imposed in India. Do you, do you are you aware of any such cases? Because I've not I'm, heard. That. I'm not, to be very honest. But I mean, just to be clear, foreign creditor taking an Indian company into bankruptcy in India is perfectly possible under the bankruptcy code. There is no restriction at all. A foreign company taking an Indian registered company into bankruptcy abroad. I think is not feasible at the moment because uh, I think Indian law guards is Comey or center of main interest very zealously. I don't think they are going to, you know, um, uh, release that. But enforcement action certainly that's that's very much possible. In fact, uh, the Chinese investors that's exactly what they did in the English court vis-a-vis -vis Reliance Cap uh, Reliance Communication. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Uh, so Bhargavi has a question for both you and Nikhil. I'll just quickly ask you, and then I'll, I'll ask Nikhil as well. Do you see interim financing work out for firms in IBC? If yes, would that, in your view, be a fair proxy of the confidence in the IBC proceedings working out? So uh, interim finance, unfortunately, hasn't taken off the way we would have expected it to. I mean, I can think of only one major case, Alok Industry, where interim finance was granted, which was substantial, about 250 odd crore. Uh, so I think Nikhil can chip in here. Nikhil and I tried very hard for SR. But I think the problem is that the lenders who's, who are there in the COC, under the IBC, lenders have a right to um, stall, uh, or rather they have a veto right over any interim financing being raised. Uh, and the lenders, because they all tend to be public sector banks, and interim finance basically means that the existing security gets subordinated. Uh, and the, you know, the interim finance provider gets a superior right over the liquidation as well as resolution proceeds. I just feel public sector banks a lot more jittery uh, signing up to something like that. And even if they feel it's commercially viable, uh, they just think twice. So I think it's less of an uh, issue of, probably it's not entirely an issue of confidence in the IBC by interim finances is failing. It's more, I think, uh, this reluctance on, on part of large public sector banks to, to subordinate themselves. Be frankly, because they fear this could be looked upon as an act of corruption. I think that, that's a very important point because without sufficient interim finance, once again, the whole uh, viability of IBC proceedings itself come into question because then how do you really keep the company as a going concern for even to 70 days? Nikhil, do you have anything to add uh, to that point? Uh, Nikhil, are you there? Uh, maybe he's, he's stepped out or he's not been able to hear. Okay, so I, we are almost uh, up. Uh, we're almost up on time. So what we're going to what I'm going to do is just give you guys a couple of minutes to give a closing statement. And uh, I think it'll be great if each of you can uh, highlight the one important change. And I know we do this almost every time we are in an IBC event uh, is to talk about the one important change that you would like to see either in the law or in the supporting institutions uh, that you think is urgently required in the next one year or so in order to further increase the effectiveness of the IBC especially in context of the current crisis. Uh, so I'll, I'll go backwards. So uh, let's let's start with you. Well, thank you. I was about to request that you let me go first. I have a call coming up very shortly. Okay. So uh, I think in my view, the government and the regulators have done a fantastic job because we haven't seen such a reactive government, you know, when it comes to IBC, whether it was 29A, whether it was the NCLAT order in SR trying to undo the harm that was caused by that judgment whether it is 32A, which cleanses the company from old liabilities, whether SEBI exemptions for delisting, takeover code, minimum public float, I can, I can go on. I think they have done a fantastic job. The, the bottleneck, in my view, is the NCLT. And I, they, I mean, besides adding numbers of, of judges, we also need a mindset change. I think adjournments need to be granted uh, less frequently and not that easily. Uh, and I think judges need to appreciate the, the timeline and how any delay actually leads to loss of, of IRR and recoveries to public sector banks. Um, so I think that mindset change in, in the NCLT, I personally feel is the most important thing. And secondly, the number of NCLT benches need to be increased. This is something you just have only important. one important change. Sorry, sorry. Just one, just one in the wish list. One, one, one and, and a half. Yeah. And, and just for the sake of it, I'm going to take a vote. Uh, how many of you want Section 29A to be repealed? So, uh, Suharsh, what's your vote? Yes or no? Partially. Very diplomatic. <laughs> only, the, only the NPA part. Only the NPA part. 
Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Harsh. And if you have to go, uh, please feel free. So it was great. I'll, I'll, I'll drop off now, Rishvi. Sorry, I could, cannot stay sure. on. Sure. No but problem. Thank you again for the opportunity. Great to be in touch with everybody. Bye-bye. Absolutely. Thanks. Absolutely. Uh, Prateek, Prateek, over to you uh, uh, in a closing statement. What's the one important change that you would like to see uh, in the next one year or so? So mainly a uh, new chapter on restructuring. Obviously, uh, it has to be a debt in possession because that's the fundamental of a restructuring regime. And therefore, for that uh, chapter, there cannot be a 29A. Uh, for the other, uh, you know, this is a rational why 29A exists, I believe. And that rationale, it's like, you know, theory of everything that uh, Viral Acharya has this theory of everything in terms of fiscal dominance. Similarly, in terms of IBC, everything ultimately leads to poor judicial capacity, right? If no one is confident that the judiciary will be able to catch the crooks, they would want ex ante rules to exclude all the potential crooks. And that's why in India, we see all kinds of detailed ex ante rules and 29A is just an example of that. Another example of that, which is going to come up very soon, is free packs. In no country is there a legislative framework for prepacks. The entire concept of prepack is that it's private contracting. But again, because we do not want to put, uh, you know, too much of uh, faith in the judicial mechanism, that's why again ex ante rules for prepacks. So right, the theory of everything here is low judicial capacity. Okay, so what's your one change? You basically want one chapter on debtor in possession, like a chapter eleven. Yes, and two others, uh, improving liquidity by allowing... Just one, practice. just one, <laughs> only one. And I, I guess your vote on Section 29A is, uh, that. What, what would you vote for? In, would, should, you, should we repeal it or not? It can be narrowed down, for sure. Okay, fair enough. Um, Nikhil? Nikhil, are you around? I, I don't think he's around. Uh, or maybe has some technical problems for which he's not able to hear or something. So Anjali, let's 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 go to you. Um, what what what's your one change in the wish list? So I agree with Pratik that uh, the source of all trouble is judiciary judicial capacity. Let me not say judiciary so openly, lest you know fingers be pointed at me. I think we need to uh, at some level stop working around the problem of judicial capacity, not delivering the outcome that it should and we need to address this upfront. We cannot keep creating uh, roundabout solutions saying this is the given behemoth and it will never change. I think that approach will not get us anywhere. Uh, so we need to solve for judicial consistency. We need to solve for judicial efficiency. We need to solve for just commercial mindedness in the judiciary and it can be solved for. It's the next big reform that this country needs. That, that, that's great, Anjali. And what's your vote on Section 29A? Uh, full repeal. Excellent. Yeah, full repeal. Okay. I, I think even clauses like uh, exclude the frauds and exclude the people who have criminal cases. I mean, we should rely on the natural commercial judgment of participants to exclude those entities anyway. I feel we, we just, you know, uh, prescribe too much because we don't trust institutional capacity in entities at all or, or or we end up using a bankruptcy law for everything else but to actually resolve firms yeah and, and i i want to make one point uh, i think okay, we, are, we are absolutely out on time okay. so i'll have to cut you short on that sure sure but, but but thank you so much everyone to all the panelists and to nikhil in absentia uh, for <laughs> the excellent and comprehensive comments i think we had a very interesting and thought-provoking discussion and I can only hope the policy makers and the powers that be are are listening to this so over to the organizers Suyash. Thank you, Rajeshwari. Thank you, Rajeshwari. Thank you. Uh, you've already thanked the panelists on our behalf. I, I want to just thank you for conducting such a substantive discussion. I really learned a lot from this. And Anirudh and I are working on papers on these issues, and we will be putting out these papers shortly after incorporating all the comments and everything. This discussion will be available on YouTube. Uh, special thanks to all the brave hearts who stayed for two and a half hours of a discussion on bankruptcy. and. Uh, uh, this is great. We are trying a new format. Uh, this we usually do short seminars, one one and a half hours. A new format, and we are going to try keep doing more of these. Maybe a little shorter, two hours. And uh, thank you again for joining us. Uh, have a good evening. Can I please you. take an opportunity to thank Suyash and Anirudh and uh, Rudra and everybody at Carnegie for putting this together and for all the effort? Because as Anjali said, we don't really see IBC discussions happen too often these days. And it's great to have the old folks back all of those who were at the drawing table um, in 2015-16. So thanks to you guys as well.
Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, Suyash. Thank you, Andy.